Professor in Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Faculty of Dental Sciences, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. Is a currently present head of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. Uh, is a fellow of International Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. President of the College of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of Sri Lanka currently. Is a board member of Center of Research and Oral Cancer, University of Peradeniya, Faculty of Dental Sciences. Is a board member of Diploma in Palliative Care Medicine. PJM uh, University of Colombo and board member of the Small Plus Tobacco Subcommittee NATA. So today, uh, Professor Jayasuriya uh, talked to us in very interesting title, Unsuitable for Dental Implants, Challenges in Dental Implant Treatment. May I invite Professor Jayasuriya, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, chairpersons, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this uh, uh, talk. Yeah. Simple, simple. Yes, sir. One second. So uh, my uh, talk for today is about uh, dental implants. And uh, when we see patients uh, uh, for placing dental implants, uh, we get disappointed when we find that uh, there are a lot of challenges. That means uh, when we want to start uh, placing an implant, we want the perfect uh, case. So that means uh, most likely a previously extracted tooth, uh, the ridge and the bone is very good. Patient is uh, not having any comorbidities. And then uh, it's a very simple and easy procedure. That's, that's our dream. That's what we wish for. But you know that uh, patients do come and ask for dental implants. And when you start asking questions, then you think, oh, this patient is not the most suitable a candidate to place an implant. So what are these challenges and uh, can, can we overcome these? And are there new knowledge that would help us to tackle this? So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So why I selected this topic was uh, I, this, uh, uh, article was uh, sent to me by one of my patients whom I placed an implant. I got scared when I saw that. Uh, <laughs> it said uh, a dentist has been sued for uh, uh, not selecting the right patient for a dental implant. In my practice, uh, I have seen a lot of dental implants placed by uh, our colleagues or uh, even from India and other places. Sometimes when you look at them, uh, they are not the best uh, placed. They are not in the most suitable environment. And the patients are also not the most uh, suitable. But the surprising thing is the implant is strong. The, the tooth is functioning and they don't have any issues. So who are we to challenge uh, these cases? Because what the patient wants is a functioning tooth and they have it. So then we uh, you know, look at all, the, all what we have been taught, how to select a patient and what cases to do and what not to do, but then people do this. And the next thing is when you start doing a uh, implant procedure or any other procedure, you find you make mistakes. That happens to anybody. I have made mistakes. But the interesting thing is, when you look back on what you have done, then you think, oh, this is something interesting. The implant is there, but I did a mistake. And then you Google in the internet to find, have anybody else had the same mistake? Has anyone reported on that? And then you find it. That's an interesting thing. So as clinicians, what we do is, when we do procedures, 
it doesn't matter it's the ideal way or not but uh, best thing is to record and then if it's something interesting yes you can publish that as well so i'm going to discuss few uh, scenarios here which i found challenging and uh, and uh, things that i have learned in my practice so if i'm going to talk about everything here it's not going to be appropriate so i selected few so it is our responsibility to place a good implant and most of all it is our responsibility to discuss with the patient whether there are limitations because you know patients will come and say hey i want a tooth and uh, patients are willing to take certain risks but uh, what i have seen is do we discuss these things do we are we open with the patient are we discussing the actual prognosis are we discussing the uh, evidence so remember best tre treatment comprises of three thing that will not happen but it is going to be a case report so there are a lot of uh, cautions that you uh, have to see in a patient for example diabetes osteoporosis patient is smoking bisphosphonates radiotherapy uh, poor oral hygiene bleeding conditions like antiplatelets and anticoagulants and then the steroid use so these uh, these are some of the things that you will find in your patients what i have mentioned in the in red these absolute contraindications so if you are going to do uh, place an implant in a patient with bisphosphonates or else who has had radiotherapy that would not be advised according to the current literature and our understanding so apart from that let's see how we can overcome other challenges so uh, some patients they do smoke but they want a dental implant is it contraindicated it's not contraindicated uh, but the literature has shown that smokers can have a poorer prognosis when you place an implant that means they can have a 1.6 times more chance of failing an implant but current day implants can you know last about 98% over 10 years so uh, failure rate is about about 2% or less so these patients will have 4% chance of failure but other thing is are they still smoking have they smoked for a long time and the number of cigarettes they smoke these are factors that you sit down with the patient and discuss do you understand that your implant can fail the patient might say yeah that's fine what will happen if it fails implant just falls off so if that's the case and if the patient understands that the literature says you can have an implant but when you uh, talk about uh, placing an implant in the maxillary area and when you are putting a short implant they have a 
much poorer prognosis in smokers. So if it's a mandible, if it's going to be a normal long implant, things may be relatively better. So why I'm telling you this is so that you know what is the evidence and you know what to discuss with the patient. So it's not an absolute contraindication. Then comes diabetes. Most of us are going to be having diabetes and patients are definitely. So we see a lot of people and uh, when they are, you know, they, when they are in a stage or an age where they can afford a dental implant, they're most likely to be diabetic. So earlier we used to be worried about this. So diabetes causes implant failure. Is it a contraindication? No, it's not a contraindication. Again, if the, if the glycemic control can be within six to eight, that is a good prognosis. So it says 92% chance of having the implant in the mouth over 10 years. So that's a good prognosis. And also we can use that to motivate the patient as well to keep your glycemic control better so that you will save your tooth or the investment that you have made. But to make things better, we can start on prophylactic antibiotics, things like mouthwashes, improving the oral hygiene. And it is recommended that you place the crown after six months. So again, if somebody wants to have the crown early, you will have to discuss with them. Uh, the literature says if you can stay for six months, uh, that it would be better. But again, like I said, if the patient doesn't want to stay a day without a tooth, then you'll have to discuss uh, the prognosis. So like I said, in my, uh, this talk, I'm not going to tell you where not to place implants, but first slide I showed you two indications. Apart from that, any other case you can do it, but make sure that you discuss with the patient. Then comes osteoporosis. That's also a very common condition we see. Patients are taking medicine. But remember, if somebody has osteoporosis, do they take bisphosphonates? So that's a thing that you'll have to discuss. And if it's oral bisphosphonates, the risk of osteonecrosis is less. Uh, but again, that's something that you really need to discuss with the patient and understand. IV bisphosphonates would be definitely contraindicated. So uh, again, prognosis is less than a healthy bone, obviously. Uh, but again, literature says it's over 90%. So that's a good uh, risk to take. And people would definitely go for uh, implants. But remember, uh, the bone will be softer. You might uh, not drill the, uh, make the, the, the normal uh, osteotomy, uh, the implant site, you might use smaller drill sizes like you would do in a soft bone. So these are technical things that you'll have to read about. I'm sure that most of you have done that. And the next thing is bleeding issues. So if somebody is taking aspirin, definitely we can do an implant without any issue. Uh, dual antiplatelets also have no major issues, but it would be preferred to stop uh, clopidogrel if possible. And INR, if it's less than three, we can go ahead and place an implant. But remember, if the INR is high, if somebody is taking antiplatelets, they run the risk of post-operative bleeding. They run the risk of a complication. So again, what I'm trying to say is that these are not absolute contraindications, but these are procedures where you should do after discussing with the patient. Both parties should really understand what are the risks that you take, but you can do that. So next thing is you uh, find somebody asking for a uh, lower molar, first molar implant. And then when you take the x-ray, you find uh, the alveolar bone height is not enough. 
I didn't understand earlier that, uh, I mean, you have to leave two millimeters safe margin from the ID canal to the implant tip. Now, everybody would think, I mean, come on, two millimeters, I can go one millimeter extra. But is there a risk? The thing is that when you have the ID canal, like in the diagram, you'll see that sometimes the burr can directly go and uh, damage the canal. But even if it is close, it produces heat. Unless it's very cool, uh, you can produce a lot of heat, especially if it's dense bone, and that heat can damage the a nerve and cause at least temporary numbness. So that is why this two millimeter margin is advised. So if you see eight millimeters only, uh, you might think, no, I can put a seven millimeter implant or can go close to the eight. I'm not going to drill into the ID canal, but then it can cause damage. So make sure that you take a cone beam CT and measure exactly. Another important factor that uh, I too have nearly made a miss was that when you have the implant drills of different lengths, make sure you select the correct length and make sure you check it. One thing, your assistant may have put the drills into the different slots. Other thing is uh, the eight millimeter and the 10 millimeter, where it is marked may confuse you. So what I'm trying to say is that when you want to drill eight millimeters, there's a chance that you might accidentally use the 10 millimeter drill to go in. So it is an unfortunate mistake if you do that, but I have also nearly, uh, you know, selected it. And then when you check, realize that that's not the wrong, that's the wrong drill. So advice to you is please keep the two millimeters uh, and please make sure that you select the right drill before you uh, start the osteotomy. So trying to uh, overheat that area, trying to apply a lot of pressure and insert an implant into that area can cause temporary uh, numbness, if not permanent. But uh, uh, the data has shown if the patient gets numbness, if you reverse it within the first few days, the numbness will uh, settle and it can heal. So if by any chance the next day or the other, the patient comes and says, my lip is still numb, then you can either take a CBCT if you have not taken earlier, assess where the implant and the canal is, and then you might decide to reverse it or else replace the implant. But after osteointegration happens, it doesn't uh, make a difference. You're trying to remove the implant. So that's the point that I want to highlight here. So there are shorter implants to make our life easier. Now, as uh, OMS surgeons, there are different ways where we can retract the nerve and put implants in, but I'm not going to talk about this because there's a very much easier way. Uh, if the length is limited, you can have short implants. So what the studies are showing is that if the implant is um, over six millimeters, you have the 6.5 and seven and eight. If it is over 6.5, six millimeters, that's a good prognosis, 95% to 100% prognosis in short implants. But if it's gonna be a shorter implant than that, uh, the prognosis can be less. So these are the things. Now, I would consider this according to the patient's age, uh, uh, what kind of implant. Definitely, if you can put an implant more than six millimeters, that would be the desired. But if it's going to be short, you can discuss with the patient and uh, plan appropriately. The next thing is the narrow ridges. So this is also a very common thing because a patient has had the extraction long time back and then you're trying to do an implant. Uh, it's narrow. 
you can't just put a three millimeter implant into a first molar area uh, and expect the best aesthetics uh, because the implant is smaller. Uh, the emergence of the crown will not be very pleasing and there'll be foot packing and problems. So if we can expand the ridge, that would be the best in these kind of situations. So early also I mentioned in a lecture, this denser burrs, these are uh, unique burrs which uh, rotates we had to turn it anti-clockwise and it's designed in a way that um, it condenses the bone. Now, if you're going to dig a hole in the ground, after digging it, you'll find all the dirt outside. So in a normal drill, when you go on drilling the hole, all the bone gets removed. But in this technique, the bone gets condensed and it causes expansion of the socket. So if this expansion is still not enough for you, now in the diagram, you see uh, expansion of the socket. That means it doesn't break. The walls don't break when you use this. After this, you can fill bone graft into this and close it. And then after six months, you can expand it further. That is if the patient wish to wait longer uh, and if you have sufficient time to do the treatment. So these are different options. And then the same can be used for the sinus. Again, this is a very important, uh, you know, we see a lot of people with short alveolar bone height in the maxillary area. Uh, when I started implants, we had to do either the direct sinus lift or the indirect sinus lift. When you talk to a patient about direct sinus lift, most patients don't like it. They think it's another surgery and you know complicated issues. Even though we can do it in the clinic under local anesthesia, a lot of patients are scared. And uh, I mean, if you don't have experience, you too might be thinking how to do this. It's complicated because you have to have technical skills or a piece of, uh, so that you don't uh, damage the membrane. And then you have the uh, indirect uh, tapping devices where you go up to the floor and then tap and increase the length. I have those uh, instruments, but I never use them because once you start the denser, it's so easy. What, what this does is like I told you, the bone will be condensed and it goes up as well. So we can increase the length by three millimeters. Um, so if earlier the ridge was five millimeters, you can easily increase it to eight and then place an eight millimeter implant. There are limitations. If the bone height is very small, you can't do that. So um, there are technical things which you will learn more if you read about this. But what I'm saying here is the common challenges where the alveolar ridge height is less you can easily uh, increase this by using this type of burst very easily. But uh, the next option is if you don't have that, yes, you can go and place a short implant. Uh, again, measure the exact uh, length and the width and select the best burr which will go. But sometimes you find uh, even if you do this, what if the implant goes into the sinus? Do you think it's a big issue? So if the implant goes into the sinus, if the perforation is less than two millimeters, evidence says the membrane will grow back and it'll cover. So what I'm saying is your implant is two millimeters inside the sinus. It'll close two millimeters or less Evidence says that the membrane will close and you will not have issues. But what if it is more? So there are studies, uh, a systematic review as well, discussing what if the implant is inside the sinus. One group has the uh, implant less than four millimeters, another one is more than four millimeters. Now, uh, 
there is no statistical significance in these two groups and uh, they have a good prognosis. Some patients might have bleeding from the nose and uh, some sinus congestion, especially in the early days. But after that, they have not found any major issues like implant failures. Now, we are not intentionally trying to place an implant into the sinus, but I have seen one patient, uh, a Sri Lankan patient, who has all the upper implants in the sinus. And that was done in Singapore. Uh, that was uh, mini implants. When you, in that best center, that was what has happened, but no issues. So that is what I'm saying. Uh, we see things, we jump to think, uh, oh, that guy has done something wrong and this happened, but you have to be very careful um, to see what, what's going on. I mean, when it comes to root canals, I'm sure I have seen many crowns without any root canal surviving for 15, 20 years. So are we gonna say, no, you better do a root canal. And if you do that, I'm sure it'll fail. So uh, that's, uh, that's the pract uh, practical situation. So here, if you by any chance find your implant going into the sinus, uh, that's nothing to lose your sleep over. You don't have to worry about it because there's evidence, uh, there's scientific evidence to say that they can survive without an issue. So you just have to follow up and see the patient. The next challenge is that, again, patients come for dental implants, most uh, likely when a root canal has failed. So you, you're, you're, you're keen on putting an implant, you see the patient and you, and you take the x-ray, oh my God, there's a big periapical lesion or a periapical infection related to the uh, tooth. So now the question is, patient wants the implant soon. Patient can't wait. So are you going to remove this tooth, clean the infection, wait for three to six months, and then place the implant? And then after three to four months, you load it. <clears throat> so that is uh, that's one, one uh, way that you can go about this. But can you place the implant immediately? So that is the question. Uh, apart from that, first one is definitely okay. You clean, extract, and you close it, and you wait for three to four months, and then you place the implant. It'll be a good site to place the implant. But yes, you can uh, successfully place a dental implant into uh, a previously infected area. But the thing is that the implant, when you place it, it should have a good bone support, the initial stability. Either beyond the periapical lesion, you find about two, three good bone. Like here, it is not very well. The implant is going up to the apex of the previous defect. So that's not a good area to gain the stability. But this implant has got stability from the lateral walls. So if you find a socket, and if your implant can be big enough to get support from the, the lateral walls, then the implant will find primary stability. If not, beyond the apical area, if you can have the primary stability by inserting the implant further, then you can do this. But again, there are ways. You just don't uh, extract the tooth and start putting the implant. You have to uh, give pre-operative and post-operative antibiotic cover. Make sure that you extract the tooth, use a, a small excavator and clean the area thoroughly, remove the granulation tissue and uh, thoroughly debride the socket, irrigate with chlorhexidine and then afterwards saline, and then you place the implant. So if you go on like that, uh, then you can have a successful implant into this position. Another problem is uh, implant fails. Are you going to do another implant? That's the question. 
uh, in my practice, I have done once, but patient is not very happy when they come to you uh, where the implant has failed uh, because they expected the implant to survive and to have the tooth. And in three months you expose and when you try to put the healing uh, abutment, the implant is rotating inside. So that's not a very good, uh, good situation. And once that happens, the next question is, what are you going to do afterwards? Patient's expectation was to have a tooth. Uh, then are you going to have a bridge or are you going to have another implant? So first of all, think what could have gone wrong. Was it uh, something local factors like an infection which was earlier where you have failed to clean it properly or else uh, was the patient of uh, you know some like what we discussed diabetic and really not controlled and or your procedure do you think your drill got heated too much do you think that you inserted the implant too tightly do you think that you didn't get um, good primary stability so these are questions that you'll have to ask yourself and then decide on placing an implant at the same place. So when the implant comes out, the socket will be cushioned with fibrous tissue. So if you just take the implant out and let it be, the fibrous cushion will remain inside. So if you plan to put another implant later, you will have to take the implant out and then uh, thoroughly clean this area. Remove all the granulation tissue and get a good healthy socket inside and then close it and leave it for uh, the socket to heal. Then only you should try to place the implant again. So literature says that if an implant fails and if you do another implant, the second implant has a poorer survival, that is about 88.8%. .8%. And if you have to do it the third time, uh, that is a little less than that. So how do we find this data? Because people have done that. People have put implants, they have failed, they have put another one, and it has failed also. That's why we have this data, because somebody has published it. So don't worry, these things will happen to us as well, but we can learn from these. So it is very important to remove the fibrous tissue very well. Uh, if you want, you can augment bone. Uh, and now if you have uh, one implant, let's say an implant bridge fails, uh, if you have two places where the implant has failed, now if you can put implants in different, different sites, I would advise that rather than putting it in the same place. So see whether you can change your implant design and uh, the bridge design and incorporate the implants into a healthier bone uh, rather than the previous socket. Uh, I'm going to do my first case, but uh, that's a novel thing where you take a CT and uh, send uh, get a uh, implant design printed and then you uh, fix it like bone plates into the uh, skull and the projections come out. So uh, maybe some other day I will present that. So in the absence of any further questions, I think uh, we will thank uh, Dr. Thank Nadine Jayasuriya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> the second lecture we have uh, lined up today is uh, uh, supported by uh, the FDI and uh, we have with us an international speaker, uh, Professor Mariati MD Dazur. Uh, she is an associate professor of teaching and learning at University of Technology, uh, MARA and at the University of uh, Malaysia. She has completed her orthodontic specialist training in 2011 and uh, her fields of interest include uh, curriculum development, orthodontic materials, orthodontic mini implants, and orthodontic tooth movement. Uh, she is, uh, she's an author of many uh, published scientific papers in research on orthodontics. 
and she's an appointed she's appointed as a member uh, an academic advisor to the Malaysian public and private universities she's actively participating as a team member for the dental specialty education committee for the development of orthodontic program standards in Malaysia uh, and also she is a professional qualifying examination committee member of the Malaysian Dental Council so with that a brief introduction we will have uh, the her lecture and uh, i invite all of you to join with the lecture hi everyone good morning i'm dr mariati have you faced any challenges when you're treating patient for interceptive orthodontics so let's go through some of the insight pertaining to interceptive orthodontics as we graduated from our undergraduate programs, we believe that we have been equipped with adequate knowledge pertaining to orthodontics and related to interceptive orthodontics. And when we have patients that require interceptive orthodontics, we do find there are a lot of things that we need to consider prior treating our patient. As we go along the curve, we notice that probably we come to the certain end that we are competent in treating patient as we come to the certain uh, limitation that a lot more that we have to learn and relearn in order to equip ourselves and be competent clinician and going through cases that require specific need especially pertaining to interceptive orthodontics there are some saying that which highlighted the, the fact that knowledge is power, information is liberating, education is the premise of progress in every society and every family. So therefore, knowledge is something that we want to inquire, that we want to share, so that we will be able to equip ourselves to be a better person and of course, to be a better clinician. Let's go through a little bit what we're going to discuss together today pertaining to challenges and insight of interceptive orthodontics. Of course, we want to know what are the time and concept, what will be the criteria, what are the challenges, and what cases that we can share together to look through in terms of perspective of uh, interceptive orthodontics and what will be the tips in order to manage this patient well. The best time, when we talk about the best time for interceptive orthodontics, patient may come to see you for um, uh, any types of dental care. They pre may present with primary dentition, uh, primary dentition that is a patient at the age of three years old, where all you can notice that all the residual teeth has erupted. And this dent primary dentition uh, in terms of interceptive orthodontics are rarely performed. However, patient who presents with mixed dentition, where they are at the early, uh, mid or even late dentition, you may notice a lot more interceptive orthodontics can be performed in this uh, dentition. Patient may present to us with permanent dentition, where all the permanent teeth are erupts. Of course, the third molar will be erupting between the age of 18 to 21. In the permanent dentition, uh, types of interceptive orthodontic, especially pertaining to growth modification, are best to be performed at the late mixed dentition and early permanent dentition. The concept of interceptive orthodontics, they always defined interceptive orthodontics, which is a phase of size and art of orthodontics. It can be performed in the early mix or mix, mid mixed dentition and however, it's most commonly performed in late mixed dentition at the age of before 13 or 14 years of age or early as possible. This is to recognize and eliminate the potential irregularities and malposition in developing dental facial complex. Of course, at this point, patient will have more tissue tolerance to reflex or to respond to our treatment. Cases that has been uh, conducted early uh, in the patient is commonly associated with cases such as in class 3 cases, cross by, and a class 2 cases, whether it's using removable or fixed appliances. 
there are many types of uh, cases that may present it to us, whether there are the need for uh, antiseptive orthodontics, specifically patients who presents with anterior crossbite, mean diastema and abnormal labia frenum. We can perform in terms of interceptive functional therapy. There are also uh, in, uh, possibility for us to look into the serial extraction. Oral habits are quite common among these patients and what can, can be done in terms of the space maintainer. For this session, I will more focus and share cases with you pertaining cases related to anterior crossbite, median diastema, and interceptive functional therapy. Challenges of interceptive orthodontics will come along as we see more cases of interceptive orthodontics. From the start to the success, there will be some strategy and what can be done to look into the possibility to ensure the optimal outcome of the cases that we treated. The first cases that I'd like to share with you is pertaining to this patient who presented with lateral, anterior and postural crossbite. This young patient that has been presented to earth have shown that she has mandibular displacement where there is a premature contact noted on the anterior teeth. Patient at the mixed dentition, you can see from this radiograph to show that the um, permanent canine is still erupting and uh, the remaining deciduous teeth is remained, indicating that this patient is on the mixed dentition. So with these types of uh, dentition, it is best for us to look what would be the potential in terms of appliances that can be used for the purpose of interceptive orthodontics. Obviously, this radiograph indicates that the impacted canine and uh, the patient presents with a class 2 scarlet pattern. For this patient, what we did was, this patient was treated with um, re rapid maxillary expansion. The fact that when you look at in the initial uh, photograph, patient has a postural crossbite and also an anterior crossbite with a mandibular displacement. Um, RME was selected because this at young age is still viable for us to expand the maxilla due to the premature fusion of the intermaxillary uh, suture um, that is allowed the maxilla to be expanded skeletally. So there will be more of a skeletal expansion compared to dental, exp dental alveolar expansion. This patient was on the rapid maxillary expansion. The um, effect or clinical presentation that you may see is the opening of mid palatal suture or the, in this case is very is easy for us to uh, assess using the standard occlusal radiograph. While when we expand the maxilla we we'll create a space for the eruption of the teeth not only for the impacted canine but also for the displaced upper left lateral incisors. If you look at in this case, it's another similar cases that we like to show you where in this patient, she presented with anterior crossbite, also with a mandibular displacement that you can assess through the position in comparison between contact occlusion and central occlusion and central relation or intercuspal position. This, um, Dental uh, pan panoramic radiograph have indicated that this patient has um, the upper left canine has still erupting and require more space for it to uh, erupt as well indicated in the dental pathomograph and confirm uh, its impaction uh, through the standard occlusal radiograph. So this patient that has indicated here that she presented with a class 3 malocclusion and uh, with um, average vertical proportion in terms of uh, angular and linear measurement, that uh, by performing uh, the lateral cephalometric radiograph and analysis would help us as clinician to look into what are the possible in terms of growth relationship when we are treating our patient for the purpose of interceptive orthodontics. In this patient, we we'll still um, find the best treatment to perform is using rapid maxillary expansion. 
um, this is more uh, to allow uh, to achieve these collateral expansion yeah, as to compare to dental alveolar expansion. So um, as we expand the maxilla, the clinical, the classic clinical presentation that we can observe that the patient present with median diastema. Um, as a clinician, we should expect that to happen as there will be um, a, the real skeletal expansion due to action given by the rapid maxillary, expansion, uh, rapid maxillary uh, appliances. Uh, patients should be informed about the presence of median diastema. The expansion of the maxilla will allow and create adequate space for the eruption of the teeth. Um, in this case, if you see that for eruption of the impacted canine and also repositioning of upper left lateral incisors. In this case, we'll continue with uh, the uh, positioning or placement of upper fixed appliances to derotate upper left lateral incisors and also for the purpose to create a space for the impacted canine. Once the patient has achieved a proper overjet and overbite, in this case, from reverse overjet, patient already achieved age to age relationship, which be in favor for us to achieve the ultimate positive overjet to ensure a stability of occlusion throughout the treatment. The third case that we see here is patient also present at a very young age. He presented with anterior crossbite of the upper left, uh, upper right central incisors. When patient presented with anterior crossbite, what the next thing we always do is to check whether patient presents with any mandibular displacement. So as we proceed, we notice that in the dental pantoramic dental panoramic radiograph, we noted that the uh, upper left, upper right lateral, upper right K9 and upper left K9 is uh, about to erupt and there will be uh, a favorable angulation for the eruption of the K9. Therefore, uh, we noticed that we do need to look at what would be um, the uh, possibility for us to create a space to allow the canine to erupt favorably. So we proceed as usual as a routine uh, procedure for orthodontic management is through the lateral cephalometric radiograph where we identify that uh, through the analysis we notice that the patient has a mild class 3 skeletal pattern and have uh, increased vertical proportion. In this patient, uh, we proceed with uh, the positioning of segmental um, fixed appliances to uh, allow the alignment of the teeth. At the same time, uh, uh, glass iron armor, uh, cement or uh, built up has been positioned on the upper uh, per first permanent molar. This is the purpose to disoclude the bite to allow the upper teeth proclination to achieve a positive overbite. Ultimately, after a couple of months into treatment, patient be, have achieved a positive overbite and giving us a more stable treatment outcome. There are, very type, there are many types or various types of treatment that can be introduced to patient who presents with anterior crossbite, whether using RME, um, a removable appliance, whether it's through 2x4 appliance, positioning of the bracket on the anterior segment or extending into the first molar. In this case, what we did, we only extend the fixed appliance up to the second premolar. Cases that have always given us a lot of um, things to think about what would be the best treatment. In this patient, she presented with a mask has two skeletal pattern with anterior crossbite. Radiograph indicated that this patient on mixed dentition and uh, requires space to allow the teeth to erupt, especially on the upper right side. The next case that I like to show you here, also patient presented with anterior crossbite and posterior crossbite 
that is due to smaller maxilla that we have seen in this clinical photo. And uh, from the uh, extra oral view, we identify this patient presented with a class 3 skeletal pattern on average vertical proportion. So uh, on this early age, they are quite favorable in terms of uh, expansion using rapid maxillary expansion, especially patient presents with um, like postural cross bite and anterior cross bite. Therefore, expansion of the upper arch may favor into uh, the positioning of the teeth. As we notice, patient who presents with anterior cross bite and mandibular displacement may present with some form of iatrogenic effect where you could see that there are mobility that is possible that is also in this case we also notice the formation of reset gingival recession of the lower NC incisors due to the nature of the teen phenotypes of the lower incisors of uh, uh, teen gingival phenotypes uh, for the um, uh, anterior segment of the mandible so we identify in terms of the nature of the occlusion in this patient. We notice that this patient still in the mixed dentition where um, the first uh, uh, premolar on the lower teeth, on the lower arch is still erupting and developing. And in this case, indicating that the canine are about to erupt on the lower arch and the upper arch is still developing and they are in quite in favor a position for eruption. However, if you look at on the upper left side, the distal taping, the upper left lateral incisors may impede the eruption of the canine. So therefore, we have to look at the possibility that what we need to do in order to create more space for the um, expansion and for the alignment, therefore, to allow the favorable eruption of the remaining permanent teeth. So this is uh, the features uh, that we have uh, can assess the fact that this patient has class 3 skeletal patterns with age to age relation. In this case, patient has anterior cross bite. Another case that we have to look at in this case, patient may present with other problem as well. In this case, this patient presents with caries of the deciduous dentition and also unerupted upper right central incisors. So when we assess our patient, we notice that patient has not um, has any teeth where the contralateral teeth in this case, which is the upper left central uh, incisors has erupted. So therefore, they should make us to think what would be the possible reason the absence of the upper right lateral incisors. Further information needed. So another record that we normally take is just look at the uh, through the dental pan, dental panoramic radiograph. We notice that uh, that is um, the impacted central incisors with dilacerated root of upper right central incisors is also um, uh, impaction of the uh, canine and premolar which is uh, disposition. So, uh, we can see in this case, uh, the lower canine is still erupting and patient in a mixed dentition. So we do know what partly the main reason or the possible reason due to failure of upper right central incisor to erupt is due to unfavorable nature of the anatomical, dental anatomy of the tooth, which is dilacerated root. So um, in this case, there is also the impacted incisors may be due to the impediment or the impeded uh, position of the lateral incisors which prevent the central incisors for erupting. So by assessing our patient, it will overcome the possible reason why we need to do. So then um, thorough investigation and thorough assessment of the patient may help to see what will be the possible strategy that we need to do to ensure that the teeth are erupting favorably into the position. Lateral cephalometric radiograph shown that this patient has favorable skeletal relationship. This patient has class 1 skeletal pattern with average vertical proportion. So in this case, in terms of growth nature, they are quite favorable. 
We also took uh, bite wing and also uh, maxillary occlusal radiograph just to look at in the position of the tooth. Um, in this case, since we do know that patient has impacted incisors, we want to assess the prognosis of the incisors, whether it is favorable for us to retract or the extraction, surgical extraction will be required. We will also have uh, taken CBCT, Combin uh, CT, just to look at in terms of the position of the tooth and relationship of the impacted incisors in relation to the bone, uh, how much bone that is present between the uh, impacted incisors in relation to other teeth. If you look at here, we have impacted incisors with the lacerated root. We also have the lateral incisors, which is tip mesially and the canine is um, about to erupt. So in this case, we know that there is a very close relationship between the um, unerupted incisors and impacted central incisors in relation to the canine. The seventh case I'd like to share with you is this pertaining to the um, median diastema in patient with low frenal attachment. One way that we can do to assess that this patient has low frenal attachment is by lifting the upper lip, stretch the upper lips, and we will be able to um, uh, assess and see the presence of tissue or gingival blanching indicating of low frenal attachment. This patient presents with a class 2 division 1 malocclusion with a class 2 skeletal pattern, increase of a jet, and presence of median diastema due to uh, low frenal attachment. So um, in young patient, in this patient, patient presented with permanent dentition. So therefore, um, other treatments by uh, repositioning the tooth using a simple removable appliance to retrocline or tip the upper incisors will help in terms of closing the gap. The dental, the dental panoramic radiograph have shown the presence of median diastema and uh, the remaining uh, teeth has erupted with a favorable crown root ratios. And there's no indication presence of root absorption in this case either. So in terms of uh, the simple thing that we can do, even using a removable appliance uh, to close the gap would be favorable in this case. Just is to confirm uh, using the lateral cephalometric radiograph indicating that this patient has class 2 skeletal pattern with proclan upper incisors and uh, with average vertical proportion. Another case that I'd like to share with you is patient presented with similar nature. Again, she also presents with a class 2 division 1 occlusion on the class 2 skeletal base. Um, we can see that the median diastema are more, uh, more presence of median diastema in this case and the position of the fr low frenal attachment are more prominent in this patient compared to the patient that I've shown you earlier. So if you look at the um, dental panoramic radiograph has shown that this patient on the permanent dentition indicating proclan upper incisors on a class 2 division 1 malocclusion on the class 2 skeletal base as seen in the lateral cephalometric radiograph. Next case that I'd like to share with you is pertaining to the patient who may present to you in the, uh, mixed dentition or in the permanent dentition with a class 2 division 1, whether those patients are suitable to be treated for the growth modification, especially uh, pertaining to the functional appliance such as twin block. The dental, panoma, dental panoramic radiograph have shown that this patient on a mixed dentition uh, with um, the upper uh, ease are ready to exfoliate and allow the eruption of the second premolar. On the lower, uh, on the lower arch, we can see that uh, the uh, ease, lower ease are still retained 
and uh, the lower second premolar is still developing. So patient uh, with the lateral cephalometric radiograph tracing and analysis, we confirm that this patient is a class two uh, on a class, a class two division one with procline upper incisors and lower incisors on a class two skeletal base. So the uh, cephalometric analysis has confirmed that this patient presents with class two, moderate class two skeletal pattern AMB of 10 degrees and she has average vertical proportion, upper and lower incisors are procline. And even in the position of the upper lips and lower lips in relation to rickets e plane, indicating a protrusive or anterior position of upper and lower lips in relation to rickets e plane. We started this patient using the functional appliance, which is a twin block. A twin block was issued to this patient. We will be able to position the mandible forward where a patient will be able to achieve age to age relationship. This is uh, the uh, design that are commonly uh, used that, uh, for, the, uh, for the purpose of functional appliance, which is twin block. When we have performed the uh, lateral cephalometric radiograph, uh, the analysis indicate uh, the result of the analysis indicating that uh, this patient um, has improved in terms of post functional position uh, after using the twin block, which is if you look at the in terms of A and B, indicating that she was she has she had 10 degree um, uh, A and B, and the uh, A and B has improved uh, to 6.5 degree indicating that um, there is improvement uh, of uh, patient's skeletal pattern. Um, uh, there are changes about 3.5 degree from the uh, uh, position of AMB prior treatment. And uh, we can see that the improvement in terms of overjet and overbite in this patient, that even this patient is still in mixed dentition even towards the end of a functional appliance that is also a good sign the fact that if patient need for the function uh, fixed appliances uh, the extraction uh, patient do not require any extraction as there is minimal anchorage need and there will be adequate space for the teeth alignment and in this case adequate space for the eruption of the remaining lower uh, second premolar have you seen in this photograph um, that is favorable for the patient to proceed. Again, uh, uh, functional appliance require uh, more compliance for the patient to ensure the success of it. This is indicating to show you uh, what would be the outcome of a post-functional appliances that we um, uh, would like to assess in terms of the skeletal pattern. And this um, Superimposition have shown you that there are um, pos pos positioning of changes in, term in terms of the inclination of the incisors and the position of the um, first molar in relation to the uh, pre and post functional appliances. And you could see that uh, the, the uh, more anterior position of the lower incisors and the mesialization of the uh, lower first molar. As we know with functional appliance, there are about 70% dental alveolar changes, where it is quite prominent in this case to show the fact that there is retroclination of upper incisors and proclination of the lower incisors, as you've seen for the upper and lower superimposition that has been done post-functional appliance. So we have continued this patient on fixed appliances and there is adequate space. We put a dead coil between the lower first molar and the lower uh, first premolar to maintain the space for eruption of the second lower premolars. So therefore, as patient continue into treatment, there is no need of extraction because uh, through uh, uh, fabric, uh, true functional appliances have 
it has facilitated us to ensure that uh, there will be a simple short treatment uh, one patient into fixed appliances it also help us to align the teeth with adequate space with minimal anchorage requirement this is to just to show you what patient presented pre-operatively and what she has achieved throughout the treatment after she is on functional appliances and the outcome that we have uh, achieved one patient at the end of fixed, up, uh, fixed appliances. We'll be able to achieve a good result, a good overbind, good overjet with a class one molar and cana relationship. Patients are satisfied with that. Combination of two phase treatment would be feasible if you will be able to identify what are the um, clinical presentation of your patient which uh, suitable at that point for interceptive orthodontics. This is to favor more simpler, shorter treatment if there is a need for a second phase of treatment. So this is a similar um, nature when patient presented to us. Patient, this patient also presents with uh, mixed dentition, increased overjet. She's on a class two division one occlusion on a class two skeletal base. So this is another case. This is a case that I like to share with you. Similar presentation where this patient presents with a class two division one on a class two skeletal base. What we can do to ensure or to assess the patient whether patient are more suitable for functional appliances or any form of growth modification is just to look at whether a patient present a position the jaw in terms of age to age relationship. You may see that there are improvement in terms of the presentation of a skeletal pattern from a class two skeletal pattern to a class one skeletal pattern which favors for the repositioning or uh, uh, positioning of the mandible forward to achieve a class one skeletal pattern. Dental uh, panoma panoramic radiograph have shown that this patient has uh, missing lower uh, right first uh, molars and the remaining teeth except the third molars are not yet erupted. Lateral cephalometric analysis indicate that this patient has retronatic mandible with 76.5 degree um, and uh, have shown that this patient are within uh, AMB of 3.5 degrees. But uh, she has a high uh, vertical proportion with 35 degree. However, we have seen that she has proclined upper incisors of 188 degrees. So when we look at this uh, patient, because patient has retronatic mandible, she has to um, uh, actively position the lower lip in order to achieve lip competency and resulting into more obtuse nasal or la uh, nasal level angle. And another case that I like to see the possible cases that you may have come across is patient presents with similar nature. This patient present with a class two division one on a class two skeletal base. This is just to show you that a patient also suitable for the functional appliances or any form of growth modification, which when we look at in terms of uh, the presentation of the teeth, we can see that this patient had root canal treatment treated on the upper right central incisors and uh, the obturation was done and we have uh, taken periapical radiograph to assess the prognosis and uh, the quality of root canal treated root canal treatment has that has been performed on the upper right central incisors lateral cephalometric analysis indicate that this patient has um, uh, class 2 mild class 2 skeletal pattern with Eastman correction indicating of 4.5 degree and patient has um, a within the low um, anterior vertical proportion upper incisors 
is proclined and uh, we notice that interincising angle also reduced. So uh, this is another case that we can uh, propose for the functional appliance. Similar nature patient with a class 2 division 1. We can notice some, some patient may present with a class 1. In this case, she, he is presenting with a class 2 quarter unit molar relationship and a class 2 canine relationship bilaterally. So, of course, when we look at in terms of uh, the uh, positioning of the teeth, the teeth are all erupted with some uh, still uh, the remaining roots are uh, still developing. It is favours in terms of um, the uh, interceptive treatment to be introduced to this patient. Latrocephalometric analysis uh, confirmed that this patient has uh, a class 2 skeletal pattern with uh, AMB of uh, 6.5 degree, um, uh, even though the isthmus correction indicating that patient has 3 degrees, but clinically patient presents with a class 2 skeletal pattern. Um, and uh, the vertical proportion is reduced at 20.5 degree. It also confirmed that this patient presents with procline upper incisors and lower incisors. So we like sometimes to perform what we call tweet ideal to find what is the ideal lower incisor inclination in relation to this patient when we compare using the uh, maxillary mandibular plane angle. So in this case, the ideal inclination for lower incisors is 99.5 degrees. So that would be something to consider if patient to be treated or to be continued with the second phase using fixed appliances. When we look at all the cases that we have gone through now, we know that the challenges that we always come through is what would be the best cases for us to treat using interceptive orthodontics and what kind of age that would be suitable when we uh, assess our patient to decide which interceptive management or treatment option will be best to select. So essentially that the tip says it, the most important is the examination and diagnosis. First, we want to assess what would be the intraoral features and also the extraoral features of our patient. A patient presents with a class 2 skeletal pattern, whether they are mild or too moderate skeletal pattern, at the early age between 11 to 14 years old, where we know that there is the range for the active growth or at the peak, what we call a pubertal growth spurt, which favors in terms of the growth of the patient as um, if we were considered to do functional appliance by repositioning the mandible forward would facilitate in terms of the um, occlusal um, correction and also the correction of the skeletal relationship from a class 2 to a class 1 skeletal features. Always to remember the fact that radiographic finding and analysis is very important and crucial for us to decide whether those particular cases would be suitable. In the cases of uh, the anterior uh, cross bite, we have to assess whether the patient clinically intraorally presents with uh, postural cross bite or anti cross bite, whether rapid maxillary expansion is required. Even at the early age, of course, we want to assess. We know the fact that the nature of uh, the mid palatal suture will only fuse at the age of 16 years old. Earlier than that would facilitate the, exp the skeletal expansion of the maxilla, which favor in terms of creating a space for the correction of the cross bite, alignment of the teeth, and it also facilitate for the uh, proclination of upper incisors to favor toward more positive overjet and favorable overbite to ensure the stability of the treatment outcome. Of course, when we plan our treatment, we have to have a specific goals. And to achieve the goals, we must have a very uh, a good strategy in order to achieve that. 
this strategy is important upon based on upon uh, based on our assessment. And when we assess the patient, we ultimately have some aims that we have to achieve. Therefore, we have to think of what would be the suitable treatment that we will propose to our patient. This treatment varies whether you want to use removable appliance, whether you want to use fixed appliance using 2x4 appliances or rapid maxillary expansion, or in terms of the skeletal um, expansion or the repositioning of the mandible in the case of a class 2 skeletal pattern to achieve your treatment aims. Um, sometimes by having to go through and find what will be best and visualize what will gonna happen is a favorable thing to do. Of course, again, by looking at the osteo-oral uh, of a patient, we'll be able to decide whether is it favorable at that point for us to achieve a class one skeletal pattern, which is the ultimate goals that we want to achieve. Uh, extra oral features, not only we want to look at in terms of the anteroposterior relationship, but we also to relate what will be the transverse improvement that we could be able to achieve as part of our treatment goals. This is what we related to the skeletal pattern. In terms of transverse, we will look at in terms of facial symmetry, whether it's achievable using uh, our simple appliances such as rapid maxillary expansion by eliminating the mandibular displacement, we'll be able to eliminate the obvious facial asymmetry and to achieve a facial symmetry as we aim for. We will also look at in terms of vertical proportion because some patient, they may not be coming to you with average vertical proportion, but they may present with low vertical proportion where the eruption of the posterior teeth may favor in terms of for us to achieve a favorable or average vertical proportion, but through um, eruption of posterior teeth and there are cases where, where we procline the lower incisors and uh, uh, allow a favorable overbite reduction and also favors for the increase of vertical proportion. A closer relationship, of course, when we treat a patient, even when we're using uh, fixed appliances, we always use what we call six or seven Andrew keys, which is looking at the optimal outcome or result that we want to achieve. So as possible in early age of the patient, our treatment probably very limited. If patient presents with anterior crossbite, ultimately what we want to achieve is we want to achieve a positive overbite favorable of a jet and we want to eliminate the uh, potential iatrogenic effects as we've seen a lot with anterior crossbite where patient may present with gingival recession, mobility of the lower incisors or even causing attrition of the lower teeth. In severe cases may see that stripping of the gums or gingiva may happen due to the presence of uh, anterior crossbite. So optimal uh, we know that what we want to achieve may not be um, achieving all the uh, six or seven Andrew keys, but ultimately it helps in terms of favor towards the growth of the child or of our baby. Again, when we look at in terms of um, treating patient through interseptic photodontic it is uh, very crucial for us to identify those cases early not only it helps the patient, it also helps us as a clinician to have a simple, shorter treatment time and it also will reduce patient burnout. As you know, if we increase the duration of the treatment of orthodontics, it may reduce patient compliance because they are already have gone through uh, burnout. Uh, these are important uh, messages that we have to keep in mind. What are the challenges actually that we have uh, when we're treating patient through interceptive orthodontics? Basically, the challenge is whether to identify those cases early and to decide whether patient really need of interceptive treatment and at what point that you should start the treatment that will be favored to the patient, whether using a different types of appliances through removable, um, or fixed appliances 
that may favor to your patient need. Of course, we will also looking in terms of compliance of the patient. Again, these challenges will make us a better clinician because we will learn through the cases that we have gone through and maybe through the discussion and a sharing session with our peers and colleagues will help us to enhance our knowledge towards interceptive orthodontics. As what the saying always say, challenges are what make life interesting and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. So by looking through your cases and learn from them, it makes us a better clinician and it helps and equip us as, as if we go gone through the similar cases again, we'll be able to manage the patient, the patient efficiently and giving a patient more favorable treatment outcome. So um, again, these are something that we can uh, keep as a take home message when we're treating patients who would possibly at need for the interceptive orthodontics. Interceptive orthodontics. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dazur, for that uh, very informative lecture on uh, challenges inside of interceptive orthodontics. And uh, I think we have uh, uh, Professor Dazur online. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I'm, it is my pleasure to be here today. So um, I'm grateful that uh, I'll be part of the, um, you know, yeah. sharing my experience to the um, all the uh, participants right thank I, you very much uh, dr dazur for joining us and uh, we can now uh, have a few questions from the audience if you have any Hello. Yeah, I welcome any question. Do you know? I'd be happy to answer any question. Yeah. Can clear aligners like Invisalign can be used for interceptive orthodontic treatment? Um, definitely, it is possible. Of course, as you know, uh, Invisalign or any types of clear aligners will be possible. Um, minimal uh, because um, the basics uh, movement when we talk about clear aligners is intrusive pause. Um, in the cases where you have a deep bite, and it also allows some form of extrusion of the posterior teeth. When you have a clear planning with uh, the respective um, uh, patient and also the uh, manufacturer, you could uh, guide the manufacturer of what kind of movement that you're planning to. Of course, any types of clear liner is possible, especially in terms of the overbar reduction, also possible. Um, so you have to look at and plan it well at what point and what kind of practical movement that you are decide, uh, intend to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We can take a few other questions, please. So I think we have uh, completed the round of questions and uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Dental Association, uh, we would like to thank you, uh, Professor Dazur, for joining us this morning. Uh, we indeed were privileged to have an excellent lecture by you. And uh, of course, I think the audience would have learned quite a lot. And uh, thank you very much for your contribution. And I think we have to thank the FDI for supporting us in this lecture. And uh, I think we have a certificate of appreciation to uh, present. So we will uh, display it on the screen and of course we will email it to you. And if you require the hard copy, we will uh, definitely post it to you uh, in the very near future. So we will uh, present uh, digitally the certificate of appreciation to uh, Professor Mariati Dazur.
Thank you so much. I really appreciate the session. I am looking forward for more sessions present, uh, with Sri Lanka Dental Association. I appreciate to Professor Nadine Jayasuri. May I invite President SLDA, Professor Manil Fonseca. <laughs> Uh, Professor Nadine, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, Professor Nadine Jayasuri has left, uh, but we will hand over the certificate of appreciation to him. So this uh, concludes the first session of the first day of the program. Uh, we will be having an official trade stall opening immediately as we finish this, and then you can uh, have your tea break. And we hope to uh, see you sharp at uh, 10.50 or close upon 11 to commence the next session. So I would uh, cordially invite you to join uh, with us in the official opening of the trade stall and please patronize the trade stalls uh, while you're enjoying your tea. Thank you. Can I learn that? No, they lost some questions. No? Okay. okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the uh, next session of the first day of SLDA scientific sessions. Uh, we are having a symposium on overcoming challenges with impacted clients. Uh, to moderate this symposium, I would like to invite Dr. Kamila Vijay Latge, consultant OMEP surgeon, district hospital, Hambantota. Uh, Dr. Kamila, over to you, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll start the uh, next symposium, uh, currently the first symposium in the uh, sessions. So this is overcoming challenges with impacted canines. Uh, as the resource person, uh, we have a, a young, enthusiastic couple uh, doing the uh, lecture or the presentation part. Uh, Dr. Katya Pereira, consultant uh, orthodontist at uh, District General Hospital Ampara. Uh, she completed her BDS from University of Peradeniya in 2009 uh, with uh, second classes throughout her career, the uh, undergraduate career uh, with uh, quite a few distinctions. And uh, after completing her uh, undergraduate level uh, studies. She joined with the uh, University of Peradhanya Dental Faculty and uh, uh, she completed her uh, MD in orthodontics in uh, 2018 and uh, currently working as the consultant in orthodontics at uh, District General Hospital, Ampara. Uh, she has a number of publications uh, as well as research papers under her name. Uh, and uh, the other uh, resource person is Dr. Tilanja Vardhana, uh, who graduated from the University of Peradini in uh, 2010. 
and uh, joined the he also has a uh, worked as a, a junior uh, the assistant uh, lecturer in the uh, department of oral surgery and uh, he completed his uh, uh, masters in uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery uh, with uh, fellowships from uh, Northwick Park Hospital, uh, London, UK, and AOM, AOCMF fellowship uh, from uh, in Thailand. And uh, he also has uh, several publications under his uh, name, uh, national and international level. And uh, he's also currently uh, holding uh, the consultant post, the OMF surgeon at uh, District General Hospital, Emily Bittier. So over to you, uh, Katya, you can start and uh, they'll continue the uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kavila, for the kind introduction. Wish you all a very good morning and welcome to the symposium on overcoming challenges with impacted canines. When we take the canine, actually, the maxillary canine is the most commonly impacted. Therefore, we'll be talking more about the maxillary canine and be touching upon the mandibular canine as well. So this is the outline of the symposium. First of all, we'll be looking at the normal development. To understand the challenges, I think, that we should understand the normal development first. Okay. So the maxillary canine, as you all know from our undergraduate days, begins its development high up in the maxilla. Therefore, it has a long path of eruption. Usually the calcification begins at four months of age, but the eruption only occurs by the age of 11 and 12. As you can see here, these are two normal conditions. The top picture, you can see it is the ugly duckling stage. This is purely normal and the canines are yet to erupt. In the lower picture, I'm sorry that this is not of the same patient. You can see that the maxillary canines are the last teeth to erupt into the maxilla. So what is impaction? It is prevention of eruption of the tooth into its normal functional position by anything, bone, tooth, or fibrous tissue. So following the third molars, maxillary canines are the second most commonly impacted teeth. Females are more common. So when we take the average, 60% of the maxillary impactions are palatal. 35% are in the line of the arch and only 5% occur labially. What causes impaction? It is multifactorial. There are two theories put forward. One is the genetic theory. It describes that the crypt position is determined genetically. The second is the guidance theory. It suggests that the lateral incisor guides the eruption of the canine. Therefore, any abnormality with the lateral incisor would result in an impaction. Also, prolonged retention or early loss of the deciduous canine, crowding, clefts, narrowed upper arches, and class two division two incisor relationships are associated. So what happens with an impaction? Of course, nothing could happen. Else, the canine may erupt labially, or If the deciduous canine is lost, there could be mesial migration of the posterior teeth and there would be loss of arch length. Root resorption of adjacent teeth, ventigerosis formation and infection with partial eruption and ankylosis could occur. So I feel that the most important of these are root resorption. So let us look into that first. I'm sorry about the quality of the radiograph seen here. You can see that both the lateral incisors 
here and here have resorption. On this side, it is obvious that the canine is impacted, therefore it's causing resorption. But what has happened on this side? In this patient, this canine was previously impacted. And with interceptive measures, this canine has erupted. Therefore, resorption is there. Resorption can be detected as early as nine years of age. But remember that it is underestimated with plain radiographs. Only 12% of cases were detected to have root resorption with plain radiography. When we do CTs, the percentage increased up to 48%. And when we do CBCTs, the lateral incisors had resorption on 66% of the cases. And resorption was detected on central incisors in 11% of cases. So let us look at this radiograph. You can see here the canine is impacted. And you can see the lateral incisor here. The lateral incisor seems to be slightly rotated and you can detect the outline of the root here. In this patient, both the canines were impacted, but let us concentrate on this canine, the left canine. When you take a CBCT, concentrate on the arrow, can you see the amount of resorption that is taking place with the CT? So this is the same patient the 2D radiograph has underestimated the amount of resorption. So what causes resorption? Earlier, it was thought that resorption occurs due to pressure from the polycle. The newer evidence says that it is not so. Active pressure during eruption and other cellular activities are thought to cause resorption. So what happens or what causes an enlarged follicle? Usually this happens with the palatal impaction. There's more cancellous bone on the palatal aspect. So what happens is the follicle extends into the cancellous bone and it looks widened. Therefore, if there's a widened follicle, it does not mean that there's resorption going on, but what it means is that it is a sign of ectopic eruption or impaction. So risk factors for resorption, females, younger children and horizontally placed canines and canines overline the lateral incisors, of course. So what would happen with resorption? If you don't do any intervention, it would continue. Else, it will stop at that point. Therefore, the importance is you need to do early treatment to reduce the degree of resorption. In the lower two radiographs, this is the same radiograph that I showed before. You can see that this canine is impacted. They have done orthodontics and now the canine has improved. Concentrate on this lateral incisor and the pretreatment one. The resorption has halted. Let us look at another case. You can see here, this canine is impacted. It has caused resorption of the lateral incisor as well as the central incisor. In this patient, there was a lack of space. And because of the poor prognosis of the lateral incisor, they have extracted this lateral incisor and aligned the canine. So this is a post-treatment or post-orthodontic treatment radiograph. You can see the extent of resorption on the central incisor. This was a young girl, she was 16 years of age. Because of the extent of resorption, they had decided to go for an implant. But as you all know, you had to wait till at least about 30 years to place an implant. So this was when she was 16. And this radiograph is when she was at her 30. So you can see that with treatment, you can stop the resorption going on. So the most important part for us, examination. You should suspect that there is a canine impaction. If you see any asymmetry of eruption, any asymmetry of palpation, failure to palpate the canine bulge buccally by the age of 10, instead you may feel the bulge palatally, inadequate space, immobility of the deciduous canine, 
increase mobility or non-mobility of the lateral incisor or the central incisor. And as seen here, splayed lateral incisors. Of course, after examination, you can decide on whether you need radiographs. You can take any of these IOPAs of the standard occlusals, DPTs, or at certain times, even lateral keflograms. So what we usually do is we take a DPT, a dental panoramic tomogram to screen. Because dental anomalies are genetically determined, these patients might have other anomalies, such as missing lateral incisors, missing premolars, or transverse teeth. But you cannot really use a DPT just to assess the position of the canine because it overestimates the angulation and underestimates the proximity to midline. Therefore, we need to take the other radiographs and I'll be talking to you about that. In the radiograph, you need to assess three Ps. It is the presence, any pathology and the position. So when we consider the position, of course, you need to see whether the canine is labial, palatal, or medallial. Other than that, you need to assess the position vertically and horizontally and the angulation as well. I'll be going into detail in a little while. So this is the position Monsieur de study, and uh, to decide whether it is labial or palatal, you have to go for the parallax technique. I'm not going to go into much about that. I just wanted to, to highlight that if you are doing parallax, it's better to go for horizontal parallax because 83% of the canines were accurately diagnosed with horizontal parallax, whereas only 68% were diagnosed correctly with vertical parallax. I think I need not mention about the slob rule. As you can see here, if the tooth moves in the direction of the X-ray beam, it would be lingual or palatal. Okay. Occasionally, it is difficult to diagnose the exact location of the impacted tooth, especially if it is in the mid-alveolar region. So in those situations, we can go for a CBCT. These are a few CT images. You can see the canine being impacted labially, mid alveolar and palatally. So CBCTs are not indicated to be used routinely. It can be used as a supplement in certain situations. If the canine inclination exceeds 30 degrees, that is 30 degrees made with the vertical plane, or in other words, if the canine looks more or less horizontal. If you suspect root resorption, you can go for a CBCT. And if the canine apex cannot be visualized accurately, you can go for a CBCT. Of course, you need to go for a small field of view. Now it is said that uh, with the new machines, there is a feature called quick scan. It is thought to reduce the radiation exposure to the size of two digital radiographs. This quick scan feature is only, this quick scan feature can only be used for detecting dental anomalies and impacted teeth in a small area. Okay, so let us see the importance of CBCT. One is it can change the treatment plan by letting you know the exact position of the impaction relative to the other teeth. And of course, this will inevitably change the path of eruption of the impacted canine. So as you can see here, just by looking at this picture, you can imagine that the canine is impacted so my hair. When we look at the radiograph, you can see here that the canine is overlying the lateral incisor as well as the central incisor. Let us look at the CBCD. You can see here that the crown of the impacted canine is lying between the central and the lateral incisor. So here, the canine crown is palatal to the central incisor, whereas it is labial to the lateral incisor. So in such a situation, you should, and you must decide the path of eruption, the path, uh, the direction of force that you will be applying. Of course, as I said before, CBCTs are helpful in deciding the damage of roots. 
Another creative use of CBCT has been invented with the stereolithographic printing, of course. If you want to do any auto transplantation, especially of canines, you can scan the tooth and make a model of it. And you can use that model to create the receptor site. Okay, so for the most important part, management. So remember that management of the canine is multidisciplinary and it often takes a long time. There are certain factors that you need to consider before attempting any impacted canine treatment. As we said before, you need to assess the position, that is, if it is labial, palatal, or medallial. Other than that, you need to see where the canine crown is. Okay, this is the horizontal position. You need to see if the canine crown is in this segment, where it should be. Or is it overlying the lateral incisor or is it overlying the central incisor? If it is overlying the central incisor, it's going to have poor prognosis. Then vertically, you need to see if the canine crown overlies the cervical half of the lateral incisor root. Is it on the apical half of the lateral incisor root or is it above? Anything above would be having poor prognosis. Thirdly, you need to assess the angulation of the long axis of the canine with the vertical plane. If it is 25 degrees or less, that means it's going to be vertical. Else, it will be more or less horizontal, which should be having poor prognosis. Other than that, age, patient cooperation, general oral health, skeletal variation, spacing or crowding will also affect the prognosis. This is the summary of the management of the impacted canine when tabulated with age. So we'll be going through the management step by step. What are the options we have? No treatment, extraction of the deciduous canine, surgical exposure plus or minus orthodontics, surgical repositioning, autotransplantation, and surgical removal. First, no treatment. When are you going to do no treatment? If the patient does not want any treatment or if the patient is poorly motivated, if there are medical contraindications, if the canine is very displaced but having no pathology. Remember, whenever you're doing no treatment, you need to warn the patient about potential risks. One thing is resorption of the adjacent teeth, not just incisors, of course, premolars. There could be cystic changes within the canine follicle, and there could be migration of the impacted tooth, especially if the canine is still forming. It has been suggested that you have to do annual radiographic review. There are no consensus yet to say whether it should be done annually or six monthly. I suggest that if the canine is still developing, you'd better go for six monthly reviews because annually is 12 months and it is a long period. Interceptive treatment. We follow the guidelines of the Royal College of Surgeons. And here what we do is early extraction of the primary canines by the ages of 10 and 13. This is an ideal case for interception. You can see here, the canines are impinging on the lateral incisors. And as I showed you before, this patient would present with the ugly duckling stage. You can remove the deciduous canines here. But remember, doing interception does not guarantee success at all times. If you can concentrate on the top photograph, both the canines are impacted here, as you can all see. So let us look at this canine first. It is overlying the lateral incisor. And with interception, in another ear, it has improved its position. Here, the canine crown tip lines at the cement or enamel junction of the lateral incisor. With interception, it has moved, it has erupted. But on this side, we have done the same interception, we have removed C's, but there seems to be no movement. So when you're doing interception, keep in mind that you need to assess the position of the canine. If it is too far mesially positioned, 
there might be no improvement. So this is what determines it. Okay, this is the deciduous canine, developing canine, lateral incisor and the central incisor. So if your developing canine is in this segment, the green colored segment, the chances of impaction are 5%. If it is overlying the lateral incisor, the distal half, the chances of impaction are 40%. But if it moves to the mesial half, the chances of impaction doubles and it goes to 83%. Anything in the red area would go up to 100%. So that is why we said you need to assess the risk of impaction. This is for palatal canines, of course. If you remove the deciduous canine, it is said that if the developing canine is mesial to the long axis of the lateral incisor, 91% of cases would show improvement. But if it has crossed over to the mesial aspect of the lateral incisor, only 64% would show improvement. And doing at certain times, just taking out the C's would not be enough. In this case, you can see there's enough, there's inadequate space. Therefore, they have done expansion. Actually, this patient had some transverse uh, deficiency. They have done expansion and created space and placed the fixed appliance to maintain the space created. So for in, as a measure, for palatal canines, they suggest extraction of C. And as the labial and mid alveolar impactions, they usually present with crowding. Therefore, they have suggested that you can go for extraction of C and D. But with the recent Cochrane review, they have shown that there is currently no evidence to support the extraction of the deciduous maxillary canine. And they suggest that even if you take out the C's, if you see no improvement within 12 months, no evidence of improvement radiographically within 12 months, it is unlikely that it would further improve and you would have to resort to other modes. Therefore, I would like to invite Dr. Tilan to continue with the surgical aspects. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Katya. And uh, I'll be talking about the surgical aspect of the impacted kind. First, uh, the surgeon, uh, surgeon's role, uh, it can be a combination of uh, uh, orthodontist and the surgeon and uh, uh, as with the orthognathic surgery, surgeon can start uh, some procedures in the impact and canine. So what surgeon can do is uh, it can facilitate the uh, autonomous ir natural eruption pathway of the tooth by exposing the crown and uh, if there is any uh, physical obstruction then uh, he or she can remove that uh, obstruction and uh, allow the natural pathway so it can reduce the time gap between the uh, ortho treatment and the overall treatment so it, that is the surgical exposure. Then it's come the combined treatment. After dis discussing with the orthodontist, uh, if we are planning for the orthodontic alignment and patient is a suitable candidate and the tooth is at a favorable position, you can either decide to go for open surgical approach or close eruption technique. Those are the mainly mentioned uh, two surgical approaches that we are following. To decide which surgical treatment to be done, and we have to consider several parameters. 
as uh, Katya mentioned, uh, we have to think about the position of the two, that is labiolingual position, mesiodistal position of the crown, and uh, the vertical position in relation to the mucogingival junction, and the amount of keratinized tissue present in relation to the tooth. So we'll first talk about the open surgical procedure for the labially placed undisplaced canine. If the tooth is superficially positioned, we can either go for a open window technique or a apically repositioned flap. The window technique, it's a very simple technique and uh, it can be done even by the orthodontist as well. So if the two, when the tooth is superficial and uh, palpable and uh, above the level of attached in Java, then we can put a small semilunar type of excision, incision and remove the overlying tissues directly over the tooth and expose the crown. Postoperatively, you can prescribe some cloexidin mouthwash and uh, ask the patient to maintain proper brushing techniques. Then the second technique is the apically repositioned flap. When the canine is placed above the level of the mucogingival junction, we can go for a apically repositioned flap. Even the tooth is displaced or uh, uh, not displaced. In, uh, in both situations, we can go for the apical reposition flap. So the advantage is with this technique is we can uh, preserve the keratinized tissues for the future periodontal support. The problem, with, problem is uh, if the tooth is deeply impacted above the mucogingival junction, the chances of uh, relapsing with this technique is relatively high. So uh, as you can see this in example, when the tooth is at the level of the mucosa, above the mucosa, uh, gingival junction, and uh, depending on the amount of bone, you can either raise a full thickness flap or a split thickness flap. If the if you have sound bone, you can go for a full thickness. Otherwise, it's better to go for a split, split thickness flap. So what we are doing is we are normally leaving a cup of gingiva around this uh, the donor. I mean, inside the region, about two to three millimeters of uh, gingiva we have to leave. Then for the flap, again, uh, we have to incorporate like one to two millimeters of keratinized tissues. Keeping that in mind, uh, we put two vertical incisions over the crown of the tooth and connecting that uh, two vertical arms, we put a horizontal incision and uh, then uh, flap is reflected apically and uh, with sutures we put position the position at a apical, apical position. Yeah, important thing is We need to keep about two to three millimeters of gingiva collar at the donor site. Then once the crown is exposed, we need to open the follicle. That's only be done on the labial aspect. Then uh, once Flap is uh, apically positioned. 
you can leave the crown to exposing the crown for the future orthodontic management. And the open surgical procedures for the palatal canine. Comparatively, the palatal mucosa is thick compared to the labial. So normally the canine is positioned at a deeper plane compared to the labial, labial ones. So in the tooth is positioned at a favorable position, we can think about going for a surgically, like, a, like in the labial ones, we can put a window type of a circular incision and expose the tooth and, the, and then the follicle. The problem with this technique is uh, once we leave the tooth, there is a high chance of uh, re or regenerating. So prevent that, we need to put a surgical pack or something like periopack or copack on top of the exposed uh, ground of the tooth. And uh, it is it is keep for about one to two weeks normally. Otherwise, there is a chance of reepithelization uh, because of the high capacity of regeneration, especially on the palatal aspect. As you can see, those two cases. Once we have exposed the crown and crown of the canine, we, we have put a surgical pack. The latest things that we can cover for covering, we can cover the occlusal surface of the canine is uh, some resin molded materials are available. So we can use because they are bio biologically very good and uh, the aesthetically also very pleasing. So we can go for those type of materials also to cover the occlusal surface of the exposed canine. Then uh, that is about the window technique. Then uh, moving on to the full flaps. So when the crown of the tooth cannot be located, we have to expose a full flap. And then try to locate the crown and expose the crown and uh, After exposing, you can remove some sort of a portion, uh, allow the crown to exterior, like in this case. You can see we have opened a full flap. Then excise uh, circular portion of that flap and uh, reposition the flap, allowing the crown, no, crown to the exterior or the, to the oral cavity. Then going into the closed eruption method. Comparatively, this is a less, less aggressive method. It is normally indicated when the tooth is at a higher position in the alveolus and uh, especially in adults patient because the, uh, the eruptive poten potential of the adults are, it is uh, less compared to the teens. So what we are doing is we raise a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap then expose the bone and expose the crown. And uh, with that, we are trying to 
yeah helping with the orthodontics to carry out uh, the orthodontic fraction This is a more aesthetically pleasing compared to the open window technique and open procedures. But the uh, issue is, uh, since the tooth is, tooth is not visible, you cannot control the forces of for, uh, orthodontic forces. That is the negative, negative side of this technique. As you can see, we can apply this closed reduction technique both for the palatal and labially placed tooth. So once we have, we open the flap, then uh, expose the crown, expose, uh, expose the crown and uh, you, you can place the chain, orthodontic chain. Then after that, you re replace the, reposition the flap. The tunneling technique, it's a modification of a closed technique. Normally we are doing for the mid alveolar lip portion teeth. So what we are doing is we first uh, extract the deciduous uh, canine and uh, through that canine, we place the orthodontic fraction downwards and uh, we are trying to get down the root in a downward direction through that uh, passage, the, the advantage is advantage with this technique is you can preserve the buckle buckle bone or buckle plate. So it's a it's a modification of close technique. So this is the here is the extracted socket of the C. This is the impacted canine. So this is the traction that has been applied through the extra extracted socket of the C. So if, if there is a tooth that is ankylosed, still we can try with this corticotomy assisted surgical exposure technique. So what we are doing is we put some uh, osteotomy like cuts in relation to the crown, but uh, make sure that we leave some bone interdentally, interproximally. So with this technique, the orthodontic can apply the traction and uh, apply the tooth into the arch. So this is a summary of what I have been talking about the last few minutes. Open surgical, open exposure technique. Normally it is done when the crown is positioned at the Mikujinjaga junction and the window technique when the tooth is more palpable at a superficial level, we can do the window techniques, then the flap procedures for the displaced teeth that are positioned above the level of mucogingival junction. You can think about going for a apical reposition flap, either split toe, full thickness flap, depending on the amount of bone present on the labial side or labial side. For the close exposure techniques, the teeth are positioned more um, placed at a higher place. We can go for a closed eruption technique. The tunneling technique, it's a modification of closed method that helps to preserve the buckle, buckle bone while you are doing the orthodontic traction. And corticotomy assisted exposure, it's done when the teeth are ankylosed. So a few words regarding surgical repositioning. 
if a tooth is position at a favorable position we can do this stick with this technique keeping the apex of the tooth at a fixed position position we can move the tooth to a favorable position by removing the both uh, buccal and labial bones you can reposition the tooth auto transplantation so what is meant by auto transplantation it is a insertion of a tooth for a developing tooth germ from one side to a surgically created to or to an existing socket within the same individual so when can it be done if the tooth is unfavorable position and you have adequate space to accommodate the tooth and uh, the root development is from half to 3 quarters complete if there is no pathology we can think about auto transplantation but the thing is the chance of ankylosis is high so to prevent that when we are performing the auto transplantation we need to follow less traumatic surgical skills because try to minimally touch the periodontal periodontal ligament and not to damage the periodontal ligament and the time period that we are going to leave the tooth outside the mouth should be minimum so in that case we can create the socket and then after that we can go for the extraction to minimize the extra alveolar time and once we have finished the once we have done the auto transplantation we need to go for non rigid fixation maybe for one or two weeks and uh, if the apex is complete then we may need to go for root canal treatment before we are removing the splint ideally within one week or 10 days if the roots are not incomplete the chances of revascularization is high so this is an example the c is present and the impacted canine is there so we reflect a three sided mucoviridis steel flap then remove the c and expose the impacted canine and take the canine out and uh, we are placed in the socket of in the c socket and uh, on top of that to support we have put some bone bone powder and then reposition the flap so after one week one week root canal root canal treatment has been done the success rate if you have transplanted the tooth into an extracted socket the rate is higher and the survival rate is roughly 15 years and so on compared to the implants having a transplanted tooth can preserve the proprioception periodontal health alveolar bone and uh, it's a one way it's a good to have a transplanted tooth then if we don't have the space for the transplant we can think about this uh, technique buckle parking so what we are doing is we take out the 
impacted canine and uh, until such time that we are creating the orthodontically space for that uh, plant tooth we can keep this tooth in the buccal underneath the buccal mucosa so once we have created the space we can go back to the buccal mucosa and take the tooth and finish the transplantation procedure so this is the last part the surgical removal so surgical removal normally done if uh, if if tooth are positioned at a unfavorable position or if it is associated with any pathology and other things like patient factors if the patient is not compliant with our treatment or the tooth is severely ankylosed or severely dilacerated then uh, we can think about surgically removing the impacted canine but the problem is if we remove the canine it can negatively affect the prognosis of the primary canine also and poor aesthetics and loss of canine eminence and loss of alveolar bone also so this is the some important points that i would like to highlight when you are removing the surgically removing the maxillary canine so if the canine is position little bit high you can think about going for a semi lunar incision so important thing is make sure that you leave about half a centimeter of gingiva at the gingival margin when you are placing the semi lunar incision or else you can go for a two sided or three sided flap depending on the surgical access that you need to have so this is the main steps that we have to follow uh, either local or general anesthesia you, you plan for the mucous periosteal flap after raising the flap create a small bony window and then try to locate or locate the crown and expose the crown then you can first try to luxate with a with an elevator if the tooth is moving then you can try without sectioning the tooth if there is any resistance then better to section the tooth section the tooth take the crown as a one part and then remove the root and reposition the flap yeah this is two sided flap expose the bone section the tooth tooth parts out and uh, reposition the flap yeah so palatal canine similar principles that means flap principles we have to adhere with the flap principles the base should be white and uh, the flap should reposition on the sound bone depending on whether it is uh, unilateral or bilateral if it is a unilateral one you can start the incision uh, from ipsilateral first premolar or second premolar to contralateral first or second premolar if it is a bilateral case you need to go for a second premolar by distal to by distal then you reflect the mucoperiosteal flap if you are going if you are crossing the midline put a we need to divide the mesopalatine bundle with a sharp cut then remove the bone and try to locate the tooth and once you locate the tooth you can first try to luxate with an elevator if there is no resistance then you can take the tooth out otherwise you need to 
to the tooth sectioning. The prob then uh, finally, repositioning the flap. The problem with the palatal canine is there is a high chance of post-operative hematoma formation. So with, for that, what we can do is we have to place a pack once we finish the procedure. Otherwise, the chance of getting a post-op hematoma is high. Or else we can put, uh, we, if, we, if we plan before, we can go for a acrylic type of a plate to wear at least a few hours post-operatively. So, in lateral case, you can start from five to canine region, then uh, expose the tooth, either you section it, or you can straight away luxate and take it out. For the bilateral case, either uh, you may need to go for from five distal to five distal, depending on the degree of difficulty of the impaction. The complications. When you are performing the surgical removal of canine, there is a chance of perforating to the nasal and uh, antral mucosa. So the tooth can displace into the maxillary sinus. And other things like post-operative hemorrhage, damage into the adjacent teeth, fracture of the apical third of the tooth can be happened. So few words regarding the impacted canine, impacted mandibular canine. The basic principles are similar to the maxillary ones. The treatment options you can either observe, expose and orthodontical reposition, surgical reposition and surgical removal. Important things to highlight in uh, with regards to mandibular impacted canine is the most of the time the tooth will be impacted on the buccal aspect because the mandible has a thick lingual cortex. So the chances of impaction is on the labially. And the other thing is when you are raising a flap for the access, sometimes you may need to most of the time, you may need to divide the mentalis muscle. So make sure that once you finish the procedure, you reinsert the muscle when you are repositioning the flap. And the chances of damaging mental nerve is also high if we are not care enough. And uh, similar to the layer, maxillary ones, you can go for a close eruption technique and AP, uh, open surgical procedures. It is similar to the maxillary one. So this is how we are going to surgically remove impacted maxillary ones. You can go for a two-sided door, three-sided flap. Try to look, locate the crown, then remove the bone, then section the tooth. Uh, if it is, if we are unable to luxate the tooth, then we may need to section it and remove crown and root separately. So that is mainly the surgical aspect of the maxillary and mandibular canine and uh, the rest of the presentation will be done by Katya, the orthodontic aspect of the management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tilan. So back to orthodontics again. So when you apply traction, remember before applying any force, you need to create space, 
right? You can do this by redistributing space if the arch is spaced. You can go for expansion, distillation, or extractions. I'll be talking a little bit about extractions later. So just a few cases. This was a case where spontaneous eruption occurred. You can see this is a labial impacted tooth. They have bonded the cleat, but the tooth erupted spontaneously. Here, this one, this is a slightly labial one, middle of the alveolus, so straightforward, traction was applied. In this impaction, you can see here that the impaction is slightly mesially angulated. Therefore, the force was applied occlusally as well as distally. If you can remember, keep this slide in mind, let us look at the next case. This is a similar situation. Here the canine is overlapping the lateral incisor. In this situation, you should not apply force occlusally and distally because if you do that, what would happen is this canine would impinge on the lateral incisor and cause resorption. Therefore, in such situations, as you can see here, you need to put an auxiliary wire, which is extending into the labial sulcus, apply direct distal force, okay? This is another case, a bit deeper impaction. This is also a labial impaction. You can see here the bone is removed and a gold chain bonded. So in this situation, I'll show you the previous slide again. In this situation, what we want to do is we need to erupt the tooth into the labial sulcus first. Okay, that's what they're doing here. This is the chain. Here there's a baluster spring and they're applying a force in this direction. After the tooth erupts, here you can see the tooth has erupted. Then it is really short, it is a straightforward case and you can apply a distal and occlusal force. What about the transposed one? This canine is transposed and impacted labially. They have exposed the tooth and auxiliary wire is here with a loop. So they're applying a force into the labial sulcus and making this tooth erupt, okay? Later on, because this was transposed, they wanted to correct the transposition. Therefore, the lateral incisor was moved palatally. After the lateral incisor was moved palatally and the tooth erupted, a tad was placed here and direct distal force was applied. These are really straightforward cases, an impaction in the line of the arch. You can see the exposure done. A pin has been placed. Now we don't really use pins. And we use vertical force to erupt the tooth into the line of the arch using a baluster spring. This is the passive position. This is the active position. And you can see that the canine has erupted. This is a similar situation using the baluster spring here a gold chain was bonded directly onto the canine. Now there's a new approach for mid alveolar impactions. What they do is they place a tad here in the lower arch, the chain is here and ask the patient to use elastics. It says that re they reduce the appliance time because the patient, it is not necessary for the patient to be on fixed appliances and it provides an excellent vector because the action or the direction of pull would be in this way. So what about palatal impactions? Those were labial ones. Preorthodontic uncovering, as Dr. Tiran said before, you don't need any fixed or removable orthodontic appliances in those situations if you're doing just an uncovering. And it prevents root resorption of adjacent teeth because the tooth would erupt autonomously and it would erupt into the palate away from the adjacent teeth. This is one such case, you can see that there's a spec exposure here and space maintained. Here they have applied traction using power chain. This is a technique, the same power chains are used as a catapult, so it's called catapult elastics. Here the canines are impacted palatally, direct force application in this way and this. But in this canine, you cannot apply direct force, uh, a force that is 
in this direction. You cannot pull this tooth straight away to the line of the arch. Why? Because it is a deeper impaction. It is overlying the lateral incisor. So you first need to erupt this tooth palatally. That's what they have done here. They have used a transpalatal arch. Those who are doing orthodontics would know. So there's a spring here and we are pulling the tooth in this direction. So you can see here the tooth has erupted into the palatal mucosa. And now it is a really straightforward case. This is another situation you can see here, these two canines are impacted. Of course, you could argue that you can pull these teeth into the line of the arch directly, but there is a risk that these, tooth, these teeth would further submerge. Therefore, what they have done is they have used two finger springs. These are the passive positions. So now when you engage them, these two teeth would erupt in this direction. You can see it here very clearly. And now it's a really straightforward case. There are case reports where they have used magnets for applying traction as well. Just a little bit about mandibular canines as I promised before. Uh, as Dr. Zillan said, they're usually mid alveolar or labial. So if they're mid alveolar, they're usually vertically positioned. You can go for closed eruption. If they're labial, they might be ectopically placed and you might have to go for apically positioned flaps. And you need to have radiographs before doing any surgical procedure. And unlike with palatal impactions, you need to have a fixed appliance in position. These are a few cases you can see here in the line of the arch, they have created space, gold chain bonded and a ballista spring used to erupt the tooth into the mouth. This canine is labially placed, but overlying the central incisors. as you can see here. So in such a situation, you cannot apply direct force, a force directed to the line of the occlusion. First, what you need to do is to make this tooth erupt and move it distally. Therefore, they have used an auxiliary wire here. You can see the hook here. So first you need to apply a force in this direction and make the tooth upright. So when you compare these two radiographs, I think you can clearly see it. Afterwards, it's really straightforward again. And remember, there are certain situations where you might need the consultation of a periodontist because the periodontal conditions may not improve 100% in all cases. So you might have to go for connective tissue grafts or pedical flaps as required. When we think about the mandibular canine, the most important thing is transmigration. It is the migration of the tooth across the jaw without the influence of any pathology. It is more common in the mandible and it is more common in females. This is the famous diagram classifying the transmigration. I'm not going to go into that. You can see these canines. This one is here. This canine is here, one here, and two of them are here. So this canine, which was impacted, is associated with a dentigerous cyst. So the migrate, transmigrated canine management depends on the position. Is it intrusively impacted? or is it erupted? If it is erupted, you can go for orthodontic alignment or surgical removal. If it is intraosseous, if it is in the bone, you can go for all these four options again. Okay, last but not least, the important facts. I feel that when managing an impacted canine, the most important thing or the most challenging would be lack of movement. So it could be due to four reasons as shown here. The first is the chain or the leakage wire that you're using could get entrapped in newborn formation if you place it on the periosteum, or it could entrap, get entrapped in the scar tissue. So in those situations, the max -fax surgeon might have to go back in and dig it again. Secondly, incorrect direction of pull. If you concentrate on this image, just forget about the incisors that are lying here. The canine crown is exposed, the follicle removed, and there's the bone here. So in case, if you want to apply a force in this direction, imagine you're applying a force in this direction, what would happen? 
the enamel of the tooth will be coming into contact with the bone. Keep in mind that the enamel has no propensity to resorb bone. So what would happen is if you're applying a force in that direction, and if you see the patient next month, the tooth has not moved. So what would you do is that you increase the force. And in another month, again, you might increase the force again. So at a certain point, the bone will give way because of pressure necrosis. It is not a physiologic tooth, man. it's just because of pressure. The problem is if you increase the force, that reciprocal force would be felt by the anchor teeth. And I'll be showing you a case report on that later. Thirdly, and most importantly, I guess, invasive cervical root resorption. 3.5% of the cases with open technique and 14.5% of the cases with closed technique has shown to have invasive cervical root resorption. It depends on the grade of infection and the patient's age, of course. So this is heterogenic. This is what we cause. What happens? When we're doing the exposure, when we're doing the acid aging, or at, at certain times, some clinician used to use a ligature wire placed around the cement or general junction to apply traction. So in this situation, what would happen is the cementum at the cement or enamel junction is damaged. Then the dentine would be exposed. So there are clastic cells in the vicinity and they would just gobble up the dentine. So what would then the bone think? The bone would then grow into the void and make it close. So now what you have is bone grown into the tooth. And even if you apply force, there won't be any movement. This was the case that I wanted to show you. I'm sorry about the quality of the picture, but I hope you can see that this occlusion is canted. This was a young girl. You can see intraorally that this canine, the canine is here. It is a really straightforward infection. But this patient has been in treatment for seven years with no movement. What has happened? You can see here that there is invasive cervical root resorption. So the clinician who treated this case was increasing the force gradually day by day or monthly by monthly. And at a certain point, they have taken the radiograph and you can see the extent of resorption of the lateral incisor because the reciprocal force was felt by the lateral incisor, which has a fragile root. And of course, ankylosis is the other cause, which might cause lack of movement. I'm not going to go into the management of that. And I wanted to highlight that if you want to go for a premolar extraction, or for that matter, any extraction to create space for the canine, you should, you better wait until you know that the canine is moving. Because at certain times, the canine might not move and you might have to surgically remove the canine. And if you have already done an extraction, you'll be left with a space that you cannot close. Resorption, this is not the resorption that I was talking about earlier. I was talking about the resorption because of the impaction. This resorption occurs because of the express torque from the bracket. So when you are doing treatment and when you're placing fixed appliances, you might express the torque of the bracket and you might move the root of the lateral incisor into the close proximity of the impact of the canine. Gingival recession, of course, with very displaced canines, if the patient is having thin phenotype and you remove a great amount of bone and incorrect orthodontic movement can cause gingival recession. You can go for contact tissue grafts or pedicle grafts, depending on the consultants you have. Then, surgical removal of the canine. When you do surgical removal, make sure that there's a good contact between this premolar. In this case, both the canines have been removed. The first premolar and the adjacent tooth. It might be the deciduous canine. It might be the lateral incisor. So in certain situations, some patients have a good contact, else warn the patient that they might have to undergo orthodontics to get this contact correct. And when you're trying to mimic the premolar to look like a canine, 
you might want to hide the palatal cusp. In those situations, you might want to mesial palatally rotate this tooth. So the palatal cusp would be somewhere here. You can go for grinding of the palatal cusp. And as the canine has an eminence, you might want to add some buccal root dog. Finally, to prevent relapse, you need to fully correct the torque of the canine. If you concentrate on this canine, you can see here, it is not fully corrected. The root of the canine is out of the alveolus. And if there are rotations associated with the canine, you need to correct them initially. You can go for precision as well if you're necessary. Always go for bonded retainers. Finally, remember this is an eruptive disorder. Therefore, early detection is necessary for interception. And if you do interception at the correct time, I think you would re uh, reduce the hassle that you might face later on. And if you are treating an impacted canine, comprehensive planning is needed. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the Sri Lanka Dental Association for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katya and Tilan. Uh, although we are just uh, lagging behind the time, uh, still the our resource persons may be uh, willing to entertain a few questions. So may I call upon our resource persons to the stage? If you have any questions, please. Thank you very much for the elaborative presentation. Uh, my quest I have two questions. Uh, one is how can you differentiate an enlarged follicle from a dendritic cyst? Uh, the second one is, uh, if there is a dentinal cyst, uh, can we apply uh, these principles such as surgical exposure and traction? Thank you. The dental follicle and the uh, dentinal cyst, uh, you can differentiate with the size. Radiographically, uh, if the size is like uh, less than two millimeters or something, most of the time it is the dental follicle. The formula. It's basically the size of the, uh, I mean, the radio lucency or the, um, uh, the area you see, but anyway, uh, I don't think that it does, I mean, uh, a lot of difference, I mean, uh, uh, with the size of the follicle, uh, the, the radio lucency, you can just think like, so, I mean, if it is a dentigenesis, it, it will be more than one centimeter or something like that, right? Quite a, a large radio lucency. So um, I think about traction you are asking when if there's a dentigerous cyst, yes. So if the Maxvac surgeons are exposing the tooth and allowing us to bond anything, I think we can move it. But the problem is there won't be any bone in that area. So you need to be very careful Then you might have to move the crown into a position, right? So you need to assess the position first. So you might need to move it to some malleability and then pull it from there. So you should not move the tooth into a place where there's no bone. So you should treat the dentiosis first, either by decompression or I'm not sure about the technique. Thereafter, we can do as normal. Yeah. 
I have uh, two questions. One is that uh, regarding the auto transplantation, uh, what are the techniques that you employ to reduce the extra oral dry time to prevent uh, the ankylosis of the uh, auto transplanted canine? And the second one is uh, regarding the buccal parking. Uh, where would you uh, do it? Is it in the alveolar mucosa uh, or the, uh, and should it be covered with periosteum? Uh, if so, uh, when you're doing it? Uh, coming into your first question, uh, to reduce the extra alveolar time, what we can do is first we can prepare the socket. So after that, we can go back to the extraction. So that limit the amount of time that the tooth is uh, outside from the extra alveolar time is reduced. And the other thing is we can keep the tooth in a solution that that is uh, that won't harm the peri periodontium. So and. Uh, Regarding the buccal parking, uh, the tooth we can uh, position just underneath the vaccinator mucosa. In the buccal, buccal aspect, you can keep it. Keeping in mind that uh, there are some vital structures like uh, parotid duct, you make sure that you are not damaging the parotid duct. So, elsewhere in the buccal mucosa, you can put a small incision and through that incision, you can uh, place the canine underneath the buccal mucosa. As uh, Dr. Tilan said, it's, I mean, your surgical preparation of the donor, uh, the, the, the recipient site, right? And uh, I think uh, the Dr. Katya told that uh, stereolithographic models can be used for, I mean, better uh, doing it uh, if you can, if you have any uh, chances of getting it, uh, you can get the exact model of the, uh, I mean, the canine and you can prepare the socket using that part, right? And uh, the other thing, if you think that you, uh, you don't have enough time, you can just keep the tooth in the same uh, position and go back to your preparations and take it out and uh, implant it there. As there is no other questions, I would like to conclude the symposium from here. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Kamila, Dr. Katte, and Dr. Tilan for excellent, very organized uh, presentations. So thank you very much for young resource panel, I would say, compared to us. Uh, so for the token of appreciation, SLDA I would, uh, would like to uh, give you the appreciation certificate. To deliver the certificate, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shanmugnathan to the stage, please. Dr. Kamile Vijayaladhyu, please. And Dr. Katya Perel. Uh, Dr. Tilan Javad. So ladies and thank you, sir. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, it concludes the morning session of first uh, SLD sessions 2022. Uh, so it is time for the lunch. Yes, uh, and then uh, before the lunch, no, okay. 
uh, there's a small presentation from uh, from Dr. Amunugama. I would like to invite Dr. Amunugama. Good afternoon. Now, just to finish the scientific session, the morning session. We all are in a hurry to run to the lunch table, collect our lunch, and have a look at the trade fair. Same with me, because I'm one of you. So I'm going to take just five minutes of your time uh, to speak, present something that has been uh, working in my mind and which I have put into practice. I think uh, I should introduce myself so that you can decide whether it's worth waiting and listening to me for five minutes. Uh, some of you know me, most of you have seen me, and those who know me will tell you uh, that I have been for improvement of our professionalism in the profession, improvement of quality of our dental surgeons. And just to say, you know, I have been involved with the organized dentistry, promoting dental sessions, scientific sessions, etc. from 1976. I've been a life ordinary member for two years. When I could afford, I became a life member, 1982. So um, it's a long history. But don't write me off as an old hack. I can talk to you it's very intelligent about the stem cells, about the nanocomposite, or anything, any of the modern things, but I kept myself updated. Then, uh, so right along my career, uh, I have served our association or profession in various capacities. And uh, we have done a lot. And you all have been, as uh, our juniors who came into the profession, we have done a lot of advanced education. We have received very advanced education. Uh, you are exposed to very modern thing. And you know the very best in dentistry today. But I see, uh, sadly, I see a bad parallel for our provision. You know, the policemen, when they pass out you know, the kid, police training school, they have a very noble mind. I will uphold the law, I will do the justice. But the pressures of life and the other burdens, you know where they end up. I see a parallel in our dental profession. Especially, we get our BDS, we graduate, we want to do the best, we have learned, we are exposed to the best, we want to do the best. But pressures of life, finance, economics, later on, make us, most, for the most of us, what we deliver to the patient is not the best, but the second best. Cost of equipment, cost of material, and financial burdens to that side. So as a senior in your profession, I looked at it. Um, I found we, we need to address improving and supporting the quality of your personal life. We need to look at how we can deliver the best. What you know, I mean, you are competent, but ability to deliver the best for your patients. Um, so, I thought about this and I thought, I have seen, seen our colleagues suffer or going down their standard or offering the second best to the patient because of the high cost of equipment, high cost of material, and the uh, say high cost of living. So, morning session and the sessions to come, will share our experts here, will share the experience and their knowledge. So I am going to share a completely different aspect. It might sound a little commercial, but what I have done. Um, we, and I, I have found, I have seen, on our own, 
very difficult. We, um, some of you may be in part-time practice, some may be in full-time practice. Uh, but on our own, to afford this, this material, basic equipment, very difficult. It's very costly. Very few of among us, I know they have got some very expensive equipment, but I don't know how long they are going to take the recover that investment. Uh, so as a solution, to my knowledge, I, I'm inviting you all to, I'm just experience, sharing my experience. Maybe you all can do it in your areas and uh, do it the same way so that we deliver the best to the patient and while earning some money for ourselves, having improving our own income. I can tell you, okay. Then, uh, so I'm sharing my experience. The main problem is the cost of equipment and the material. Then as a solution, I formed a, uh, I joined with the investor and formed a company where I thought that we can afford the heavy, good equipment, quality treatment. But then I had to depart from them, the, the investors. They were focusing more on money. They were more on fleecing patients. I moved out. Then I again joined with another investor, a reputed group of companies in optical field, who appreciate the modern technology, who appreciate the value of investing in them. So I may sound a little, little commercial. I want, as you know, I, we have to remain within our ethical limits, professional limits. If you feel, if any of you feel that I have stepped out of that ethical boundaries, please. Tell me afterwards, because I'd like to correct myself. So as I said, uh, I formed a company. Can you comment, please? Just give me a second. Desktop planning. Desktop planning. So I uh, formed a company uh, with two ground rules. Whatever we offer and when we charge from the patient, it must be affordable to them. Number two, this company cannot exploit the doctors, dental surgeons. They must get their fair share of financial uh, uh, component for their professional work. With these two ground rules, we started a company and we started a unique one. It's a, it's a chain of dental hospitals with very high equipment, material. I just take two minutes to show what we have set up. The company name is Dental One. Of course, I just run through. These are objectives, vision, vision. You can see my two ground rules, not exploiting the patients, not exploiting the doctors. That is one of the ones. Then what is uniqueness in this? I said it's a unique one. We have set up a chain of dental hospitals, interconnected, database interconnected. A patient can come to any of our dental clinics and get have the continuity of treatment or the, even the doctors can visit any of a dental clinic that is convenient to them and continue their treatment. So either way, because it is, centrally connected, the information is shared. So, of course, this is a picture that slide I use when I speak to Lehman. 
we are different then these are the services that we offer in our clinics when i say we offer there the uniqueness remember it's not our company and surgeon company service consultant that going to do it's we are inviting you to come and work in this setup and offer your service, best service to best service. now if you take in our clinics we have the general dentistry facility we offer the, we give you the best material things like the 3m maybe show for one beautiful uh cention if it's glass i am as fuji i'm just mentioning trade names for you to understand be for the best material and if it is so if i do a restorative work yes we have, of course we use the best alginate we give the best uh, uh vinyl material impression material we have even endos endos can you know how cost that is you have the latest equipment uh, to work it so if it is surgical procedures we have the best material we have dedicated rooms for your minor surgery in fact we are going to very soon we are going to provide even hospitalization so you can do anything under ge if it is pediatric surgery we have we, we have it is if anybody come there you have the mini hand pieces mini bars and if you are trained you can practice even medusalam little anesthesia no problem and when it come to it is as a orthodontist if you want to practice we offer the material best nitty wires power chains all the equipment other than the very important instruments of course then the trendy aesthetic dentistry we have office bleaching and then of course for the advanced uh, treatment modalities we provide the equipment we provide the material you you can practice so the rest of it is uh, again you can see the is the whole spectrum this is if you are interested in any of these field you are invited to come and uh, practice in these places just few pictures passing the quality the standard of our surgeries uh, this is the one in we are already operating two is the reception area the extract room we have very advanced you know rvg machines digital dent uh, extract um, facilities uh, we are just about to get a cbct in fact we have orders but the supply is still reluctant to quote the price we'll be having cbct as well and we follow very rigid sterilization standards central sterilization in all our clinics and this is just a good locations we set up our clinics in good location with good parking for your doctors and good parking for uh, patients uh and uh, this is a very sorry uh, new hospital that was set up in our neighborhood where we are going to have the uh we will be having uh in uh, uh theater facilities for your in uh in patients facilities is available at this place then very importantly i'm very proud about uh, the dental assistant that we provide we provide very highly trained dental assistants in fact uh, uh, any senior nurse will be able to assist you even carrying out cpr if needed or you want to have a cut down and put a butterfly and uh, maybe dextrose infusion they're that capable so i think you all know how valuable to have a good train well trained dental assistant so this is uh, is my experience what i have done thinking what we all need so i am inviting i can see i have seen some brothers who have come all the way from batiklo from all the like far distant people 
places. Uh, these facilities are available. You can bring your patient and you use any of our clinics. And if, if there's any possibility of setting up this type of thing in your area, please do it. Then it's economical. We can charge less from the patient, the patient affordable charges. And the same time that as professionals, we can get a decent income, enhanced income. Uh, this is an area we think we all should look at so that we do the best, we enjoy our work uh, and we live comfortably. Then uh, is more or less uh, commercial talk. As I said, we have to, I have to walk the very thin line of being ethically correct, professionally correct. But the bottom line is having enough money for all of us to live decently. So I am I'm with you all for the next two days, today and tomorrow. The financial aspect of it, you can, you can explain. I can just telling our model, but I expect you all to set up something like that in your area. And the uniqueness, I said, I mean, I saw that doctor coming from Hambantota or Mr. come from Katya coming from Ampara. Maybe you want to see your patient, some man in Colombo in the neighborhood. Just tell us, phone us, reserve the surgery. The surgery is there with well staff. Uh, and as I mentioned, those equipment are very costly, but you can use it. You are exposed to it. We have seen it in abroad. We are seen in seminars, but you never have, I don't think other than the Pera, the school, any other places, all these equipment. Use it. And I assure you our system is, it's very fair by the patient, very, pro, uh, very fair by the profession. Thank you very much for listening. I'm available for any clarification. Thank you. So we are going to go and enjoy. Our Metal. Uh, I don't want to speak what it is and how it is uh, from this podium, but I'll come to among you and I'll tell you what it is, how I have done it. Okay, it's among friends, no more professional. This is uh, uh, a medal given the Rotary Club, World Road International Rotary Movement for major donors. I'm not boasting, please. Just sharing my information here since he asked. Uh, this is for a this medal is given to major donor who has contributed ten thousand dollars to the charity fund. Gentlemen, I worked hard, I worked within profession, I worked ethically, I earned enough money, but it was very tough. I came to a position where I could donate this amount, but it was very tough. Then these those are the things that moved made me. Going to this line, I don't think all of you should suffer as much as I did to earn that amount of money, but we can practice comfortably, earn a decent amount of money and live happy. Thank you. This as a friend. Thank you very much. And so we'll break for lunch and uh, we will start the next session sharp at 1.30 because we have to finish on time in order to get the, the inauguration started. So please uh, join us for lunch and be back sharp at 1.30 for the next session. Thank you. Central nerve system, the patient is uh, much difficult to get the new muscular pattern. So, 
the habituation to dangers is is the problem and the new adaptation to the new danger is very much unlikely so other one is the mental changes and as well as the patient cooperation and the financial resources and we should know that about according to intraoral changes and the systemic diseases and the nutritional deficiencies and the mental attitude all these factors which affect the prosthetic treatment outcome of the elderly patient <clears throat> and the process of assessment of the elderly patient usually we have to start from the steps in the identification of the data to the delivery of the prosthesis so according to this there are 10 steps the unfortunately as a clinicians we usually start from the number 6 the first five uh, steps we uh, we neglect we omit but uh, if you have if you talk with the, uh, the young patient you must probably start from the steps number 1 but when you the when the the old patient come you straight away start from the uh, number 6 so that should not be because now uh, very important when you deal with the elderly patient you have to start from the number 1 and recently uh, I, I can give a small example we are recently <coughs> about few days back one patient came to my clinic uh, her age is about around 67 years and she told me about 20 years back she visited the dental clinic and the dental surgeon talks with her fair amount of time and after that uh, actually she visited that uh, her dental surgeon must be and after that uh, she went abroad and came sri lanka and several times and recently she went to the same clinic and the dental surgeon won't talk even the one second start from the straight away start the treatment and uh, she was being very unhappy and after that she came to me and she asked uh, whether dental surgeon in sri lanka has any affinity to do treat young patients i told no i don't think but probably in the these days they are, everybody are busy, busy and they are you know very rushed with the and going for a queue for the, to search in the fold that must be the reason so anyway that is uh, you know the patient will think about that so therefore when you start the treatment especially in the elderly so you have to start from the identification of the data <coughs> Then the other fact is uh, determination of the individual oral functional capacity is very important. And this is the therapeutic. There are the OFC, we call the OFC, which include the three parameters. The uh, number one is therapeutic capability. Therapeutic capability means where the patient is. Patient sometimes in the nursing home, even the home bounded, whether the patient has a chance of to get the therapeutic. Or, whether the patient can, you know, uh, stay on the dental chair for a long time, whether the patient can open the mouth for a long time. So these are the factors which determine the oral functional capacity. Then the number second is oral hygiene ability, whether oral hygiene measures can be carried out with the patient or guardian, or whether the patient has, patient can reach to take the uh, oral hygiene products. So oral hygiene ability, then the other one is self-responsibility. So whether the patient are capable of acting their own volition or organization themselves. So that is especially when the patient wants to get the, the decision-making process. Whether the patient has a, a guardian, the legal person. So these parameters are important to determination of the individual oral functional capacity so that we should determine before start the treatment plan so determine the mental attitude to the patient so in 1958 the person called jamie son he told fitting the personality of the age patient is more difficult than the fitting the danger to the mouth so in that way there are several specifications which uh, uh, the determine the mental attitude of the patient. 
so what i prefer the winkers classification according to their there are four categories the hardy elderly that is the uh, class the <coughs> that <coughs> category the patients are well preserved and they are very social and very professional active physically and psychologically and they can adapt very well to the age then the second group is senile age age syndrome actually they are disadvantaged uh, physically and emotionally and as well as they are true age and the handicap the third group is satisfied with the old denture wear even we they wear the denture with lot of problems they use the denture you can't correct it even you correct it he is actually the patient is coming for not to correct the denture to the clinic so all is the patient wants to satisfy with all dentures sometimes the, there are the ulcers in the mouth but patient doesn't want correct it the fourth one is patient who doesn't want the dentures so the patient doesn't have any desire to accept the dentures so they are not actually so these the last two category, categories the satisfy old denture wearers and patient who doesn't want wearers these two categories people very difficult to treat so the prognosis is very poor and when you treat it's very very difficult they are not accept the our treatment plan so these are the two uh, problems and patient wearing with the denture and having the ulcers and the irritation but still patient accepted <clears throat> and the is very important the geriatric psychologically the psychological aspect when you treat the patient so always is better to talk with the patient having a let's talk and giving a good communication with the patient and good rapport with the patient that is very important and you can uh, talk patient the very lengthy period and <clears throat> get the, Uh, make the appointment the short appointment and sh- shouldn't promise too much and the maximum work amount of work within the short period you better do it and they will explain and the patient and discuss with the family members and if the patient is really relaxed and you can give the oral sedation <clears throat> if patient approach in depress and you have to consult with the physician or oh, but in these cases in the uh, when the patient depress you should not sedate and schizophrenic patient should accompany with the family members and these patient you should not authoritative and even the dementia patient always reach with the empathetic approach so extremely patient is extremely physical and mental stress is not ideal candidate therefore the psychology when treating the jaded patient the you know the prosthetic confidence of assessing is very important the psychological issues which come across in prosthodontics <coughs> uh, psychological uh, factors which prosthodontists come across in the clinic in the top of the iceberg so we treat the patient without considering the psychological issue if we treat the patient without thinking about the psychological issue psychological issue and there is a higher chance of recurrence of the disease therefore our as a prosthodontist as a clinician our duty to assess and address in the management of the psychological issue of the patient because the thorough understanding of the mental state of the patient help the prosthodontist to plan the treatment accordingly and you will get the good outcome better outcome and the excellent prognosis therefore uh, geriatric psychologic should learn and have in knowledge in the uh, when you do the uh, treatment for the elderly patient so geriatric psychology in part and parcel of uh, prosthodontics aspect <coughs> and identification of the re- uh, risk factors is the another one and you know the patient is having the lot of caries and the root caries and the rapidly progressing caries and the periodontal situation is not good and you can get the resorption and functional problems and the root tear is is you know the the reason is the gingival recession and the active microflora 
and it's very much uh, in the elderly people and even the rapidly progressing care is a serious problem in the especially in the frail and dependent elderly because these uh, issues you have to address before you start the treatment and the periodontal disease is another one and you have to identify the risk factors again that also which affect the prosthetic treatment and the fair and now when you do the start before start the prosthetic treatment if uh, prosthetically uh, if the periodontally the patient is very much affected especially in the frail or dependent elderly we have to treat first the periodontal aspect before start the prosthetic treatment so in case if one the stable periodontal condition can be established then you can uh, go ahead with the prosthetic treatment <clears throat> then the intraoral changes and the face of challenges is there are a lot of intraoral changes that you can come across in the elderly patient the loss of teeth the shifting of the over eruption remaining teeth and you can get the hygienic difficulties and the non parallel abutment and the extensive restored root surface the root aspects cervical caries wound dentition and the thickness of the mucosa is reduced and uncompensated posterior tooth loss so altered taste sensation altered salivary gland function reduce vertical height so you can get the effect of the chemo or radiotherapy so all these intraoral changes is the challenges when you, before when you start when you manage the elderly patient <clears throat> so these are the some of the pictures that shows and even the patient with having patient might get the angular colitis as well and the next one is the <clears throat> factors the contribution to the nutritional deficiencies and the oral the changes ability to chew the food now uh, prosthodontist has a role to manage the nutritional deficiency to some extent but they can't do the 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 factors affect the physical that is the how they absorb nutrients the metabolic nutrients but anyway the changes in the ability to chew food if the patient is not uh, chew foods and not masticated properly and not shallow and patient won't get the correct nutrition the automatically the physical changes also to be correct to some extent so therefore so identify the nutritional deficiency of the patient is very much important as a prosthodontist and you have a role to manage this patient to some extent <clears throat> so very important uh, thing is uh, before I think about the prosthesis the shortened dental arch concept the strategy actually we uh, towards on the anteriors and the premolars and the first person who discovered the case <clears throat> and coworks and he has given some criteria and contraindication and what situation what are the indication that shortened dental arch concept can be applied so in the criteria you should have a good prognosis of the anterior and premolars otherwise you can't adapt you can't uh, use the shortened dental arch concept and there should be a good motivation of the patient and this is very much important in nowadays because with the economic crisis i think because limited finance available for the treatment so therefore uh, applying shortened dental arch concept uh, especially in the countries with the economic crisis is very much important but when you apply the shortened dental arch concept there are several contraindications yes, advanced tooth wear and periodontal disease and when the if the patient having a habits of para uh, para functions or tmj disorders or any marked disparity between the upper and lower then uh, shortened dental arch concept cannot be uh, <coughs> applied because the shortened dental arch it says even with the there's no uh, even with the applying the shortened dental arch there is no incidence of having the symptoms of temporary uh, temperamental dental disorders and there is no significant association with occlusal wear so patient doesn't need to 
uh, insert the denture doesn't need improve the oral function with the dentures so without the dentures so patient can chew chew and swallow the foods so therefore no uh, significant difference uh, be, uh, with the full complement teeth and the uh, teeth with the shortened dental arch but in the later uh, according to the cano and carison in the 2006 and he has found 70 to 20 percent hinder the chewing ability function and they had to practice some food preparation in the alternative way so there may be migration of the teeth or eruption so mobile teeth in the lower alveolar level uh, other fact is uh, the shortened dental arch uh, concept cannot be applied you shall not apply uh, less than 40 years old people and <clears throat> combination of the occlusal loading and exiting periodontal is, is the risk, risk factor and uh, there are uh, few uh, documents published and it says the short dental arch probably represent the high risk group in uh, for the periodontal disease patient so anyway we need some studies to recommend uh, that is means association between the short dental arch and the uh, risk of periodontal disease <coughs> so with this background it is prudent to ensure when you plan the treatment for all partial dental patient to discuss the option of not replacing the missing teeth and you can discuss with the pros and cons of this choice <coughs> so with regard to the prosthetic treatment the gtt uh, dentistry it should be based on the 3s principles the first one is simple to handle for the patient as well as with the third parties so that is the simple to insert and remove and the uh, the denture is the, should stable and should avoid in fractures so whether to better denture construction the cobalt chromium or metal denture any type of metal denture and the solid planning of the prosthetic treatment so if you made the solid plan so there will be no recurrence of the dental problems in later in life so no dental problem i expect in the next uh, near future <coughs> so when you place the uh, prosthesis it's better to think about the transition of the dentulousness rather than giving the denture first so if you have the long progress of the dentition so we can have a gradual transition of the dentulous so then the patient is will good adaptation psychologically patient is uh having a very uh, very much adapted so therefore the transition of dentulousness is very important fact when you consider the prosthodontics aspect so <clears throat> in that case we should not mini uh, we should minimize the unnecessary soft tissue coverage and rest should not be placed in the compromise abutment teeth and questionable teeth we should cut it and make the the non vital root so in that case we can place the over denture so in way that after 6 to 12 months we can place the new replacement of the complete denture so this is the transitional denture with the rod wires uh, <coughs> it should uh, actually minimize the gingival coverage so the maximal extension of the free end especially in the free end uh, cases when you design the occlusal table is with the occlusal table you should reduce and avoid in the place the denture teeth correspond to the distal part of the denture base in especially in the free and lateral cases there are no retentive class palm opposite the fulcrum line so it's better to have in the two retentive class for the retention so basic design with the uh, normally with the other uh, age groups the path of insertion should have a many parallel surface and receipt is rigid uh, receipt 
should be placed in order to you know withstand the uh, occlusal force and the number of class should be minimized and connect every not even the connectors even the occlusal rest and the reciprocal now should be very rigid and uh, no compound do not encroach the root surface and minimal number of components should be placed for the retention and the support so this uh, design is important when you uh, design when you uh, place the denture for the elderly patient so this is a tooth bound <coughs> tooth support or removal partial denture and the placement of minimum uh, number of class you can have you can see only two class one here another one here there's no uh, no clasp the opposite the opposite the fulcrum so we call this uh, type of uh, design is called we call the bikini design on the rest placed opposite the fulcrum Similarly, the no return to class palm opposite side the fulcrum line. Again, the same. Only we play the rest, but no, no clasp here. Even here, the this is the fulcrum line. Opposite, no rest or no clasp. But even in the but in class three, class four, class five, class six cases, it's uh, better to place more posteriorly. To the diagonal of retention, rest are placed posteriorly in order to, you know, uh, avoid the aesthetics. And uh, the location of the retentive arms, the the place of the location of retentive arms should be considered. <clears throat> then the rest seat, and in this concept. You can have the two lines. One line is uh, diagonal of retention. Other one is the fulcrum. So in this case, you can see the distension partial length. The fractal line is placed anterior to the diagonal of retention. This is the line. This is the other line. So the fulcrum line is placed anterior. This is the the. The back line is diagonal of retention. The uh, front line is fulcrum line. So this should be placed anterior. So there, then if you place like this, there are no exerting torque on the abutment teeth, and there are no necessary to place the indirect retention as well. And other thing is uh, whether we need indirect retention. Actually, no, because uh, indirect retention. Sometimes we can get the interaction with the occlusal rest, even the lingual rest, right? Even with the denture base, mucosal support denture base, anterior or posterior to the diagonal retention. So in this case, especially for the maxillary uh, denture, there's a gravity uh, when the direct retention is poor. So in that case, it's very important to get the correct retention of the polish polishing surface and uh, we have to think about the concept of the muscle balance. So if we correct it, the concept of the muscle balance and the correct inclination of the police service, there are no, no necessity of uh, placing the indirect retainers. Then the choice of abutment teeth. <clears throat> if the abutment teeth is uh, the fail, then we should uh, think about the more mesial, more abutment teeth as abutment. The correctionable uh, tooth, we can keep as a non-vital route. Then we'll have to think about the over danger. This is uh, very much important with the elderly patient, very successful in the mandible and the more benefits and psychological benefits are more, more proprioceptive fibrous, uh, you know, uh, given the signals that the danger is in situ and Advantage in the search clinical situation, especially in the transition to the dentulars, when you have an unstable abutment teeth and hybronic patient, the cleft palate patient. So if the saddles have conflict in the path of insertion, in those cases, 
uh, you can place the you can think about the o danger even the precision attachment retain o danger is another one especially if the retention is severely compromised uh, especially the first time complete danger wear and with the poor muscular control then you can apply the precision attachment retain o danger <coughs> so that means either stud attachment even the bar attachment even the tooth supported bar attachment and even the telescopic over dangers you can place and the magnetic retain over danger especially for the low arch then the next one is uh, thinking about the giving the complete denture <clears throat> now when you uh deal with the complete dentures the patients there are several uh ways that you might handle the management of the complete denture the one thing uh, the first thing is the <coughs> the referrals from the specialist opinion so you will get the reference and the immediate placement of the complete denture and you can get the uh, modification of the existing denture and even the construction of the denture copied from the existing denture and you can get the placement of the new complete denture and you and do the placement of the implant supported complete denture so these are some <coughs> categories then you will come across and out of this very important is the referral from the specialist uh, opinion <coughs> the referral for specialist opinion as a prosthodontist you should know about the the condition called burn in mouth syndrome and the intolerance of the denture because uh, the burn in mouth syn uh, syndrome is not only for the denture wear even non denture wear also you can get the burn in mouth syndrome with that you get the hyposecretion uh, or hyposecretion saliva nausea difficulty in uh, swallowing and change in gastric sense so if the patient comes to you with the denture wear with burn in mouth syndrome you should know whether this is probably due to the denture or not due to the um, or due to the other cause so there are uh, three main three causes one called the local causes and the somatic and the psychogenic causes so you as a dental surgeon as a prosthodontist you should identify <coughs> the burn in mouth syndrome is caused by the local causes even the local causes may be either denture or not due to the denture now patient is wearing the denture but patient is having the para function and the temperamental even dysfunction and still you can get the burn mouth syndrome but on the other hand with the denture irritation allergic or infection again you can get the burn mouth syndrome so therefore <clears throat> it's very important to know in which the what is the cause so in that way it's better to consult with the uh, the psychiatric or psychologist again or your uh, intimate or your physician to see the cause of the burn in mouth syndrome so because you know the now local causes either danger or non danger even the somatic causes you can get even the anemic iron deficiency anemia even the vitamin deficiency even the patient with the menopausal woman and the diabetic uh, like that there are several some uh, systemic condition that cause the uh, burn in mouth syndrome apart from that psychogenic if the, if the patient is having stress or depression again if patient is having underlying psychological issue again it can cause the burn in mouth syndrome so therefore the management is very difficult and approach it should always be careful you have to symptom you should always taken seriously and you have should get the the team work with the psychologist psychiatric and the general physician so especially when you do the comprehensive prosthetic treatment should be carried out after you having a collaborative team work with these people <coughs> and the denture copied from the existing denture is another important factor 
because the use of the copy complete denture is <clears throat> very important because most of the patient is uh, cannot accommodate the you know elderly patient as i told you due to neurophysiological uh, problems they cannot accommodate or habituate the the changes in the design of the prosthesis if the tooth position and the polished surface are quite comfortable in then it's better to uh, carry out the technique of the copy complete denture so sometimes patient might have patients back might have a set of the complete dentures you can get the whole set and ask the patient which denture the patient is more likely so if the patient have having the 10 sets patient will give the one set this is this set i like but still patient is not wear in much but the patient may tell this set is a little compared to other sets i like so what you can do you get the set the the denture up and lower and that you can get the denture as a template and for the even for the impression you can use the denture so that is the way the how you consider about the copy complete denture then again somebody will ask even if the, the same denture patient will not use but why you, you again make another denture the reason is the patient use that denture you can ask what are the problem that is that denture having that denture and you can alter you can only change the change the that part only in the denture because polish part is no problem having there's another small problems that might be either due to some psychological issues or even not so anyway with the most uh, usable denture you can get and you can do the copy technique <clears throat> then the immediate complete denture is the another one again uh, uh, you can have advantage because physical physical adaptation is to wear in the easy and denture teeth take over the function of the natural teeth and patient suffers less psychological issue so uh, patient should but having good cooperation so with that the one by one the teeth can extract and make a immediate complete denture not <coughs> having the the abrupt extraction better to have the step by step extraction and maintain if possible you can maintain the roots and we can provide the denture so this is very much important for the uh, giving the denture in the low uh, low arch and modification of the existing denture there are several ways especially uh, the modification is diminution at the accuracy of denture base adaptation due to residual rich resorption in these cases uh, you know the soft tissue also can come change and the relining and rebasing is the the treatment choice but before you do the relining or re, uh, the rebasing check whether any extension of the denture base or unstable occlusion whether denture teeth, teeth are placed labially or buccally or with the occlusion pain is uh, deviated is not correct so in these cases uh, in these situation the relining rebasing is not valid <clears throat> so there are three different procedures for modification of the extension denture one is the uh, insufficient denture fit without occlusal modification and second one is significant modification of denture bearing tissue with acquired occlusal force with another one modification with severe tissue deterioration and poorly fit in extension denture with significant decrease of the uh, vertical dimension and the unstable occlusion with the number one insufficient denture fit without occlusal modification in this situation you can place uh, best thing is not the reline the basin uh, the because insufficient fit you can manage with the close mouth technique impression the second one significant modification during denture bear in tissue with the acquired occlusal force and the occlusal force can be correct later and first you can manage with the relining and rebasing then after that mount in the articulator and you can do the acquired occlusal force but the third one is very difficult modification sometimes uh, you can do it but most of the time you have to uh, uh, make a new denture <coughs> so if the modification the existing denture is if you modify 
if the patient is not satisfied then the problem so therefore always you have to better the existing denture should alter at a diagnostic denture and ask the patient to use for a couple of weeks and to ensure satisfaction the before preline re bsc do it otherwise patient is not satisfied <laughs> then the complete denture most of the time we know is the problem of the uh, is the mandible the low arch with the resorb bridge so in that case there are several uh, techniques which use for the uh, management of the resorb bridge but uh, for the easiest way and the what i prefer in the finkler's technique and where you can make the uh, again close mouth technique and uh, first you uh, do uh, get the correct vertical uh, dimension and uh, do the functional movement do the functional impression with the uh, uh, tissue conditioner with the tissue conditioners you can apply 3 4 times then the final wash impression you can take with the light body impression so this is why this is the way uh, the you can deal with the resorb mandible and uh, because when you apply this when I mean the close mouth technique with the correct vertical dimension ask the patient to close the mouth the patient close the mouth the same occlusal force patient applied even probably in the during mastication and uh, normal occlu occlusal uh, having normal occlusal force and uh, the close in mouth during the impression is the same so other one is there are no interference with the handle and we can uh, <coughs> record maximum denture bearing area so therefore the the close mouth technique is very important for managing the resorb mandible so this is the the technique first you take the impression and then after that you can get the tissue conditioner and make the functional impression and when you do the functional ask the patient to do the wrist in tip in movement right ask the patient saloing so various facial move, uh, functional movement patient can do it and even the latter part with the taking the uh, with the impression taken with the uh, light body definitely you have to ask from the patient to do the more functional movement the patient should generate the functional movement not the dentist should generate <coughs> so this is the uh, the picture which shows the mandible denture fabricated by the open mouth and closed mouth impression technique you can uh, clearly see the difference uh, how the two dentures there are a maximum denture bearing is covered with the close mouth technique and other important fact is <coughs> uh, leaving the second molar of the maxillary denture especially in the uh, the patient with the resorb mandible because uh, maxillary force is directed toward the vertical residual ridge so risk of mandible displaced anterior is reduced by leaving the second molar so with that it easy to obtain the balanced occlusion during the protrusion so with the removal of the second molar maxillary second molar we have to incline the second molar then patient can nicely do the movements <coughs> and uh, in the elderly patient you can see the neuromuscular disorders and the problem especially in the patient with the cerebral ata ataxia the loss of coordination and even with the sometimes the patient the parkinson is very difficult we can you can get the tremors and these tremors is very difficult to get the impression and especially the centric position you can get very difficult so unstable mandible the difficulty in recording so keep the patient in the supine position and use the four fingers both hand over the lower part of the mandible and and bimanual manipulation the mandible thumb place above the symphysis and very simply you can get the centric position this is how uh, special in the uh, patient with the loss of coordination in the elderly patient even for the uh, not even the elderly patient even the young patient also we have the loss of coordination you can apply the same principle and patient suffering from the un uh, unilateral facial paralysis 
this is more restricted to the neutral zone this is very important the fit of the impression surface and the magnitude of forces transmit through the polished surface so therefore the neutral zone technique should be applied and <clears throat> the other one is rehabilitation with the removable partial lenses with the occlusal on lace and you know with uh, tooth wear patient with or without reduction in the young patient we do the orthodontic or prosthetic approach and subsequently we play the crowns but uh, this treatment is not feasible for the elderly therefore a removal partial denture with occlusal only is considered for this patient so in that case we before that uh, before apply uh, before doing this treatment you have to first uh, do the extraction and conservative approach and sometimes you may have to place the occlusal splint because you will have to increase the vertical height and there's a gross uh, occlusal changes so you can ask the you can give the occlusal splint by the way the second the the final denture definitive denture with the occlusal uh, with the onlays patient can adapt very nicely because with the occlusal splint what happen patient can adapt to the increased vertical height as well as the gross occlusal problem can manage so <clears throat> ask the patient to wear the occlusal splint for one to two months and make sure the patient can accept the modification of the vertical dimension and gross occlusal uh, irregularities and these applications usually in the the removal partial denture with the occlusal uh, with the onlays uh, usually place in the three clinical situation one is the uh you remove the teeth and patient will get the occlusal imbalance so in this case uh, before place uh, placing the removal partial denture with the onlays you can give the occlusion splint and because the patient uh, once you extract patient might get the occlusion imbalance that can be correct with the giving the occlusion splint <clears throat> even the the second one is partial to tooth loss associated with uh, with or without vertical dimension again uh, removal partial denture with the occlusion with the onlays and even with the treatment with the occlusion on say onlays you can give with the posterior tooth loss associated with the reduction in the vertical dimension of the occlusion so in this patient once the, because the, there is a trauma to the incisive papilla that can be correct once uh, you place the uh, onlay remote partial nature with the onlay because in this case you can see only we give the denture to the upper arch not the lower arch because there is a even uh, increase the vertical dimension about 3 mm still we cannot place the teeth for the lower arch so keep only place the teeth for the upper arch that can be contribute with the shortened dental arch concept and patient can function nicely <coughs> and the other ma other main important fact is uh, dental uh, denture maintenance and you know there's a role uh, the extension <coughs> if the denture is having the any any uh, gross accumulation of the foot or the plaque there's a possibility of the candle infection so therefore always we have to provide the denture with very good polish denture and if not there's adherence of the plaque so we ask the patient to clean the denture every day otherwise what will happen the main important fact is the role of candida in the etiology of the stomat uh, stomatitis sorry even not even the candida you can get the other bacterial even the act actinobacillus actinomas streptococcus aureus still can harbor in use of all danger and the recent research suggests there's a correlation between the bacterial pneumonia 
and the oral candidiasis and the removal partial denture serve as a reservoir for rest uh, respiratory pathogens so in that case and there was a study done in 2015 they have found the prevalence of pneumonia in 85 years patient wherein removal partial denture at night associated with the 2.3 fold increase the risk of incidence of pneumonia that indicate with the unhygienic denture and the chance of having the chance of getting the pneumonia so this is unhygienic denture then you can get the candida stomatitis denture stomatitis and even with this uh, the the top picture shows the immunocompromised patient that is the uh, problem is more severe and <clears throat> the last part is uh, i have to say about the resin bonded bridge and the implant and the resin bonded bridge is uh, you know usually indicated the patient the shortened down the dental uh, with the patient with the shortened shortened dental arch and we can uh, place the resin bonded bridge to replace the anterior teeth right so partially de reduced dentition with the sound teeth having the sound teeth the resin bonded bridge is Uh, is the choice then we will come to the implant and <clears throat> there's no contrary indication for the implant for the elderly but there are the restriction the restrictions are risk in the implant surgery and deterioration in the implant function and the deterioration in the maintained condition so therefore very important to assess in ca on case by case assess the patient the risk here physical and mental factors the medical history and the uh, drug prescription what the patient has and the expectation and social environment and patient might have uh, several medical conditions but in some medical condition patient think that is contradicts especially in the type 2 diabetic if the diabetic is managed properly you can place the implant no problem even the uh, you can talk with the physician and especially the cardiovascular uh, disease but if the patient is having again uh, some uh, therapy like bisphos bisphosphonate the implant is not suitable <coughs> so when you do the implant it uh, you have to minimize the surgical trauma always better to get the flap flap surgery and avoiding the two stage surgical procedures that means you try to avoid the augmentation procedures and the sinus lift those surgery is better to uh, limit should not do and the uh, usually the sh the short and narrow implants are better and the implant should have in titanium circumferential alloy that is having a more strength and you should know whether patient can maintain the good oral hygiene <coughs> and special the elderly patient you should have a back off strategy to facilitate the oral hygiene at the late age life that means if you place give the implant with time and uh, patient can because the implant is fail uh, due to foot trapping so you have you are thinking to give the uh, implant supported over denture so in that case you should uh, have knowledge if you play the single implant it's very difficult if you have the uh, uh two piece implant then you can remove the attachment especially the through retain one it's much better then you can place the implant over denture even with time if after latter part of the elder then patient can even tolerate the denture then you can remove the attachment you can place the just place the cover through and you can keep the implant in situ you don't need to remove the implant but if you you if you place the uh, single piece implant then you have to cut the implant it's big hassle for the patient so better to think about Place the two-piece implants, but on the other hand, two-piece implant is not the short and narrow. Even you have narrow, but 
it's bit, it's bit wider. <clears throat> so this is the picture. This shows the back off strategy is not respect to the one piece implant as not possible to remove the attachment. So in this case, you have to cut the implant. So that the conclusion, what I can say, the dental care is in, in this indispensable aspect the maintain the quality of life in old age. So dental care and treatment make good social connection, which are key to the happiness with age from young elder to the old elder. So act of smiling trigger the hormone in the body associated with the happiness. So therefore, the throughout the elderly period, if you give the good dental care and treatment, the, the patients are very happy. Patients are very happy, very happiness with the, in the, even the late in old age. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gunatilaka, for your very comprehensive uh, lecture on prosthetic management of for the elderly patient. So, as the time is the factor, I can give a chance for only one question from the audience. Is there any questions? Very quick questions, please. Uh, as there is no question that uh, I would like to conclude the, the session uh, to present the token of appreciation, I would like to invite our president, uh, Professor Mali Fonseca is developing. Can I call Dr. Sangha to come to the stage, please? Thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, we are about to start the free paper session, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nilanth Ratnayaka to chair the free paper session. And I think we have four free papers, so uh, I would uh, hand over the microphone to Dr. Nilanth Ratnayaka to, to start the proceedings. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, so uh, since we are behind the schedule, we will straightforward start the free paper session, and uh, I'll uh, brief the ground rules of the free paper session. Uh, presentation time will be 12 minutes and there will be three minute question time. And uh, we have four free papers and the order of presenting will be the free papers appear, uh, the order that appears in the uh, conference manual and uh, the best uh, free paper will be selected and uh, it will be awarded a cash prize. So, uh, um, 
uh, after 10 minutes i will give you a give a block uh, like this and uh, after 12 minutes there will be two uh, signals so that you have to uh, stop presenting and there will be 3 minutes question time okay we'll uh, start with the first um, presentation uh, the title is altered passive eruption a clinical problem less known uh, authors are r godevitana and uh, wpaw gunatilaka and the uh, presenting author is dr r godevitana i would like to invite dr godevitana to present you good afternoon everyone uh, today i'm going to uh, talk about a, a case a report on altered passive eruption a clinical problem which is less known so these are the contents of my presentation. Starting with the introduction, altered passive eruption is a clinical situation produced by excessive gum overlapping over the enamel, resulting short clinical crowns, which can give rise to gummy smile. So this condition can cause poor smile aesthetics, as you can see in the first picture, and a difficulty in maintaining oral hygiene, it is considered as a risk factor for periodontal diseases and difficulty in doing crown restorations and more prone to gingival trauma during mastication because of the excess gingiva. So this, uh, apart from altered passive eruption, the gummy smile can be caused by hypermobile upper lip, upper lip line, high upper lip line or smile lines and vertical maxillary excess. So this is just to recall the normal anatomy of the dentogingival junction. So the alveolar crest is usually located uh, about two to three millimeter apical to the cement animal junction, uh, allowing the biological width which is the epithelial and connective tissue attachment. And this normal anatomy is altered in altered passive eruption. So this uh, pathogenesis of this condition is uh, during tooth eruption. Uh, it is mainly comprised of two phases, the active eruption phase and the passive eruption phase. The active eruption is uh, emergence of the tooth from its bony crypt into the oral cavity and meets with its antagonistic tooth in the occlusive plane. And in passive eruption, there is a relative eruption of the tooth by apical migration of the uh, soft tissues. So the altered passive eruption occurs due to failure in the passive eruption phase of tooth eruption. And uh, according to Coslet, the physiological passive tooth eruption can occur until uh, the age of 18 to 20 years of age. So we can observe in such patients uh, if they present with altered passive eruption. And there are in the literature several etiologies for altered passive eruption, such as a failure of active eruption due to any interferences by soft and hard tissues, and uh, the presence of thick fibrotic gums, presence of thick alveolar bone, any genetic causes, and endocrine causes such as hypopituitarism, hypothyroidism, and uh, following orthodontic treatment, and due to primary failure of eruption. In 1977, Coslet came up with a classification for altered passive eruption. In their classification, uh, they categorized this into mainly two types. Type 1, uh, they have uh, more than 2 millimeters of keratinized gingiva. And in type 2, the case, uh, width of the keratinized gingiva is less than 2 millimeters. And then they subdivided these types uh, to type A and B depending on the relationship between the alveolar bone crest and the cement enamel junction. In type A, uh, there is normal alveolar crest to cement enamel, enamel junction relationship. That is, uh, the alveolar crest is located about two to three millimeters apical to the cement enamel junction. In type B, the alveolar crest is uh, usually located at the CEJ or even coronal to the CEJ level. 
So in type 1A altered passive eruption, as you can see in this picture, uh, there is uh, more than two millimeters of catenized mucosa. So the mucogingiva junction is located somewhat uh, apical and uh, there is physiological distance between the alveolar bone crest and the cement enamel junction. But in type 1B, uh, the alveolar crest is located at the level of CEJ. And in type 2A, the catenized mucosa is less than two millimeters because the mucogingiva junction locate, located somewhat uh, coronally. And uh, again, uh, regarding the alveolar crest and the cement animal junction, there is physiological distance. And in type 2B, the catenized mucosa is less than two millimeters and uh, the alveolar crest is uh, located more coronally. So the diagnosis of altered passive eruption is mainly a clinical diagnosis. Uh, in the examination, we can uh, look for the smile line, lip line, whether it is normal, high or low, and the lip mobility. And intraorally, we can assess the clinical crown dimensions, such as crown height, width, width to length ratio. And uh, the width of the catenized mucosa the mucogingival junction location, the gingival zenith levels, uh, the gingival sarcus probing depths, and uh, we can detect uh, the cement enamel junction through periodontal probing and uh, the type of gingival tissue, whether it is thick or uh, thin type, and uh, the, whether there is any incisal attrition of the teeth, which can give rise to, again, the short clinical crowns. And uh, investigations that we can carry out are the conventional radiographs that are taken in parallel method. And in the radiographs, we can see the cement enamel junction and the alveolar crest and uh, bone sounding through trans sarcus probing and cone beam CT. So the treatment is mainly uh, surgical. And uh, in the pre-surgical phase, we have to uh, improve the oral hygiene and uh, obtain uh, good uh, gingival health and uh, surgical treatment, we can carry out crown lengthening procedure. So the crown lengthening, we can carry out either apically repositioning flaps or gingivectomies with or without uh, osteotomy. So the type of surgical procedure depends on the width of the catenized gingiva and the location of alveolar crest uh, in relation to the cement enamel junction. That is mainly depending on the classification of the altered passive eruption. So in type 1A, since there is more than two millimeter of catenized tissue, we can simply go ahead with gingivectomy. No need of uh, osseous reduction because there is physiological distance between the alveolar crest and the cement enamel junction. And in type B, 1B, again, we can go ahead with gingivectomy, but osseous reduction is re uh, required. And in type 2 cases, we cannot do gingivectomies because there is limited catenized tissue. So always we have to go for apical reposition flaps. And in type 2A, osseous reduction is needed. And in type 2B, no osseous reduction is required. So let's move on to our clinical case, uh, the patient uh, that we have managed in our clinic. Uh, he's a 26 years old male patient presented requesting restoration of uh, upper right central incisor, which was fractured two years back. And according to his past dental history, root canal treatment was carried out, but coronal restoration was not carried out. So in the extra oral findings, he had low lip line, low smile line, and normal lip mobility. So uh, his teeth were barely visible, so he was not worried in restoring the fractured tooth. And in the soft tissues, there was adequate width of catenized gingiva of seven millimeters, and the gingival phenotype was thick, flat, and uh, there was uh, uh, shallow probing depth in gingival pockets, uh, healthy periodontal tissues were there and uh, the gingival zenith levels were symmetrical but uh, more coronally situated and the heart tissues regarding uh, upper right central incisor it was a complicated crown fracture tooth with GIC restoration on excess cavity and uh, on both labially and palatally there was uh, insufficient tooth substance for any direct or indirect restoration 
and comparing with the left central incisor, the dimensions, it was more or less uh, square shaped, the length and width was about 8.5 millimeters. And uh, the CEJ was not detectable through the transcircular probing and uh, we couldn't find any attrition. And there was generalized spacing in the upper anterior region and short clinical crown heights in all teeth. And there was a cross bite in relation to left, upper and lower canines. So the diagnosis was uh, regarding upper right central incisor, complicated crown fracture, which was pre previously root canal treated uh, with uh, an inadequate corona tool substance for extra corona restoration. And uh, it was diagnosed as altered passive eruption type 1B. So the treatment plan was formulated as this. Uh, first, we improved the oral hygiene and then diagnostic models were taken and uh, such uh, model trimming to the uh, desired gingival level was done. And using that trimmed model, we prepared a surgical stent. So using this uh, surgical stent intra-orally, we uh, marked the uh, uh, suggested gingival margin and uh, we did the incision, uh, internal bevel incision, and uh, we raised the full thickness mucoperiosteal flap and the excess gingiva was curatized with RACI curates. And using the surgical stent as the uh, proposed uh, restoration margin, from there about three millimeters apically, we did the bone reduction, the excess bone was removed. And in the last uh, bottom picture, you can see after osteotomy. And in the palatal aspect also, uh, in relation to right central incisor, we did the crown lengthening. And this is after uh, sutures and uh, two weeks after suture and before suture removal. And in the bottom picture, it is one month post-operatively. And uh, following the surgery, we did uh, fiber post and crown buildup of uh, right central incisor. And uh, he had uh, generalized spacing. So we suggested orthodontic treatment. He was reluctant to go ahead with orthodontic treatment. So we did uh, direct composite restorations to uh, close the gaps. And uh, we did crown preparation and he was given temporary crown. Uh, and after six months of surgery, we are planning to give the permanent prosthesis. So this is the outcome. And in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that altered passive eruption is not an uncommon condition, but uh, it is usually left undiagnosed. So we can improve the patient's aesthetics, uh, mainly by surgical treatment. And we have to make sure that we uh, do not violate the biological width. We have to reestablish the biological width. These are my references. And uh, concluding my presentation with a uh, very well known public figures who had the who also had the same condition thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr godevitana for sticking to the time uh, and uh, now the presentation is open for discussion should ask questions from the free paper presenters because they get marks for the way they handle the questions. Yeah, uh, this patient's complaint was, uh, he was requesting restoration of the uh, right central incisor. He was not worried about his aesthetics, but in order to, uh, give a prosthesis for the and preserve the tooth and give a prosthesis for the central incisor we had to go ahead with the crown lengthening procedure but doing a localized crown lengthening would not be justified in this sort of situation because obviously this patient had a generalized type of uh, short clinical crowns so uh, we went ahead with uh, the uh, crown lengthening procedure in the aesthetic region from uh, canine to canine region Any more questions?
there are no any other questions uh, thank you very much dr godevitana for your uh, elaborative uh, presentation we'll move on to the next uh, free paper uh, it is the title is rehabilitation of palatal defects with removable prosthesis a case series uh, authors are smbs navaratna rm jayasinghe and ip tilakumar presenting author is smbs navaratna Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today, this presentation is regarding rehabilitation of palatal defects with removable prosthesis, a case series. Um, in introduction, maxillary defects can be congenital or acquired. The congenital ones are usually cleft palate patients and acquired are usually due to surgical defects caused by um, palatal pathologies like uh, surgical surgeries due to uh, carcinomas and uh, Trauma. The main objective of max maxillofacial prosthodontic is to restore normal oral function and improve the facial aesthetics. The meticulous designing of the definitive obturator is the ultimate goal in achieving a positive attitude for the patient, which improves the psychological well-being. Multidisciplinary approach is uh, in management of maxillary defects result in positive outcomes. So the first case is a 56-year-old female with residual cleft palate. This patient presented to uh, the prosthetic department of teaching hospital Peradenia, requesting a and of complete dentures with the uh, replacement of the, uh, uh, with, the with the residual defect. On the extraoral examinations, um, she had marked facial asymmetry with the uh, Upper and uh, upper bilateral cleft lip uh, repaired uh, cleft lip repaired scars, but the um, cleft palate has not been uh, repaired. And uh, in her facial profile, also you can see that she has the constricted maxilla with uh, uh, class three facial profile. In the intraoral uh, intraoral examinations, uh, she was completely identical, and her mucosa was normal in color and texture, but she had a uh, cleft palate with the right uh, with the right side alveolar cleft, which uh, which uh, has uh, extending to the uh, uh, right side alveolar region, and the lower arch uh, is completely identical. So as with normal construction with uh, dentures, we uh, did the primary imp uh, impressions with stroke test, which was modified, and then um, the. Secondary impressions were uh, impressed for the, the special trace were ordered. We did the border molding for the periphery and for the defective area. And uh, the secondary master impressions were taken with regular body silicone and in the lower arch with light body silicone. And we constructed a permanent base to do the jaw relation recording with the with a bung, which is uh, engaging on the defect, which will make the uh, bite registration phase more stable and the upper and lower um,
you will get extra time for the time you lost. Uh, so the uh, upper uh, complete denture with the, uh, the obturator processes and the lower complete denture was constructed. And these are the post-operative photographs of the patient with, uh, uh, with good outcomes of aesthetics and function. And you can see in the lower picture, post-operative view, patient has good facial aesthetics and the facial, facial profile is also improved. In the second case, it's a 45-year-old male who has presented with left side maxillary defect, sorry. Uh, left side maxillectomy uh, due to uh, amyloblastoma. Uh, this patient, uh, the extraoral, uh, extraoral findings with uh, deficient left side uh, maxillary with uh, gross facial uh, asymmetry was present. In the intraoral uh, examination, the, the, he, he has lost the defect uh, includes the, all the teeth on the upper left side, uh, including uh, one one, and the whole left side maxilla and the palate was also uh, excised due to the uh, surgical excision. And the, the, the defect is, uh, the, is about more than 10 um, millimeters in depth. And the lower uh, arch, uh, he has only lost only one tooth on uh, three six. And uh, so, and also this patient has limited mouth opening. And when the patient presented uh, to the clinic, he had a covering plate modified with uh, many uh, layers of uh, tissue conditioner. Because of that, you can see that there is some inflammation in the oral uh, palatal mucosa. So we had to wait until that has been resolved. Uh, to get the uh, to construct the obturator. Also, the patient was being a follow up in the uh, oral and maxillofacial department because they were suspecting some recurrences and some changes. So, therefore, we couldn't go for a permanent uh, uh, obturator with metal. So, we constructed the acrylic. Uh, uh, the plan was to construct an acrylic obturator. So, as usually, we uh, uh, get a uh, special tray with uh, acrylic and the border moldings were done and special tray uh, impression was taken. And then the covering, play, we made a base plate uh, with a bung, but this bung was a hollow bulb uh, because and the class were placed with Adam's class. So with this, we did the bite registration recording, which was more accurate. And we constructed a, a acrylic obturator processes. Uh, during the bite registration stages, we uh, emphasis more on uh, more on replo replacing uh, his um, the deficient tissues on the left side maxilla. And uh, this is the final outcome where the function uh, aesthetics function as well as the deficient, deficient uh, tissues were also been restored. Uh, when you compare it with the pre-operative pre photos and the post-operative, he had a good uh, aesthetic and a functional outcome. Uh, in the th in the third case uh, is a 20 year old male with right side maxillectomy due to hemimaxillectomy due to recurrence of a mucopidomide carcinoma. This patient had had a cystic lesion uh, excised at the age of 18 years, but in, at the 20 years of age uh, also he has uh, another surgery done and the patient presented to us with, uh, the, with the interim obturator to get a definitive obturator. Uh, in the extraoral feature uh, photos also there is a uh, uh, on the right side, you can see there's a, a slight facial asymmetry on the upper lip. And on the facial profile on the right side, uh, there's a marked deficiency of uh, lower fa uh, facial tissues. Uh, however, this patient has good oral hygiene, good, uh, very good uh, oral tissues uh, with a deficient uh, palatal defect, but there were some remnants of remnant of tissues uh, on the upper palatal uh, perioperative, upper occlusal view, you can see there are some uh, tissue tags. However, to construct the definitive obturator, patient did not want to get uh, take, uh, do a surgery to get rid of these tissues. Therefore, we have to const we had to construct a, a permanent uh, metal based uh, obturator with these uh, existing tissues. So we couldn't um, make a, a big uh, bung out of the defect. Uh, so therefore, we construct the metal uh, metal obturator with. Um, 
taking all the uh, existing uh, teeth and heart tissues which is present uh, at the moment of the patient this is the this is how the patient came to us with the interim prosthetic intraorally uh, patient had uh, problems with regurgitation and uh, hypernasality of voice because the uh, interim of prosthesis was not uh, up to good uh, um, condition uh, we, uh, we, as usual, we uh, co construct a special tray, do, did the border molding and got the primary master impression with regular body silicone. And then uh, the wax up, uh, this is this was the design of the um, processes. We engaged almost all the teeth to the obturator to get maximum support and retention and stability. And uh, it was constructed in the tripod, uh, uh, tripod design, which um, all the tooth next to the uh, next to the defect and the distal defect uh, was also uh, included in the design, uh, because this. Uh, Two, 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 two had a good bone support during the excision of the lesion, uh, keeping more bones to the tooth. So we construct the metal uh, framework, and then uh, we did uh, the altered cast impression technique for the with this uh, with this metal uh, plate with the bite registration, and the obturator prosthesis was constructed with uh, routine means. And this is the final outcome with uh, good aesthetic uh, and function. And I want to mention that in two two, since the tooth, uh, since when the when the patient miles, uh, if we place a clasp on two two, there it will be aesthetically compromised. So we extended the uh, eye bar towards the uh, lateral canine, and then uh, this is how it. Uh, how the outcome of the uh, processes came and uh, the improvement of the aesthetics uh, were also could uh, we could get the improvement of the aesthetic and function mm, like uh, the facial fullness the upper lip fullness uh, and was also uh, we obtained so um, in discussion uh, the maxillofacial prosthodontics play a major role in aesthetic and functional rehabilitation in acquired and congenital orofacial defects loss of oral tissues as a result of pathology and surgical interventions results in structural alterations in certain patients where processes become the only feasible option such as in uh, patients like that because we sometimes we can't uh, replace the lost tissues with uh, surgical means the preparation of the oral tissues prior to definitive obturator construction is a mandatory process the prompt designing of the processes according to the orofacial tissues which is not affected by pathological process is important removable processes which present in all above these three cases were designed to optimize the retention stability and support with the existing oral structures and the existing defect and occlusion of the processes is a mandatory consideration when it comes to removable processes, which optimize the stability. The equal distribution of occlusal forces in centric and eccentric jaw relationships minimize the uh, pre premature context. Narrow occlusal table in acrylic density will ensure fewer displacement forces to the defective side by occlusion. So osseointegrated implant retained prosthesis and surgical reconstruction in invade the rehabilitation of maxillary defects these days. But there are certain limitations on replacing such because of the recurrence of the uh, disease, comorbidities, high cost and high uh, advanced technology. And unsuitable donor sites are some of the examples where you can't uh, in, uh, you can't practice osteointegrated implant retained processes and surgical reconstruction in certain patients. Therefore, prosthetic rehabilitation of maxillary defects uh, with removable processes is still a feasible and cost-effective and more conservative approach in certain selected patients. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Navaratna, for sticking to the time. And uh, now the uh, presentation is open for discussion. Now your your uh, presentation in is uh, on a case report, 
uh, which uh, yeah, implicated <coughs> removable prosthesis uh, for rehabilitation of palatal defects. So <coughs> how are you going to use this information in managing your future patients? Uh, I mean, you know, the information gathered through your, your case report. Um, almost all the patients with maxillary defects have been um, referred to uh, prosthesis until they can be uh, rehabilitated with either surgical means or with osteointegrated implants. Certain patients sometimes until that we need to uh, construct uh, prosthesis to give and certain patients like they some patients they are not um, like uh, not uh, aware of these uh, processes that can be uh, replace the tissues with the processes so that they can have a normal aesthetic and functional uh, function. So these can be implemented. Moreover, so, uh, um, uh, uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach, so we can collaborate with our other colleagues, such as maxillofacial surgeons, and certain um, so certain prosthodontic procedures can be implemented in such patients. That is the knowledge I gained with these three patients. And uh, so, in the uh, in the first case, that it is a, it was a congenitally unrepaired uh, cleft palate. So that pa patient was uh, without any prosthesis for a, such a long time, for 56 years. So this pa that patient also had a normal, good function and an aesthetic rehabilitation with the prosthesis. The other ones. Any more questions? There are no any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nairu Narata, for your presentation. And uh, next free paper will be done by um, uh, the authors are EMK Sena Ekanayaka and EMUCK Herath. And the presenting author is EMK Ekanayaka. And the title of the presentation is A Rare Disease from Patient to Child uh, Dentinogenesis Imperfecta. Sorry, I read the title wrong. A rare disease from parent to child. Dentinogenesis imperfecta. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, you all. This is about a rare disease from parent to child. That is none other than dentinogenesis imperfecta. There are a few cases that I have come across uh, during my postgraduate training at the Faculty of Dental Sciences, and these cases were managed by postgraduate trainees at our faculty. Let's see a bit from this rare disease. Actually, this is uh, characterized by abnormal dentin formation, first recognized by Barrett, and the prevalence is about 1 into 8,000 births. And it's mainly autosomal dominant disorder, affects both primary and permanent teeth, but severely affects the primary teeth. This is due to a mutation of dentin xyloposphal protein, which present in dentin and bone, and uh, collagen protein encoding genes, mainly one and two. Clinically, teeth are opalescent with color ranging from brown to bluish gray. Enamel is normal, but due to the absence of scalloping between the dentin and enamel, uh, the enamel is cracking away and exposing the dentin. It leads to rapid attrition, loss of OVD, and extensive decays. Radiographically, bulbous crown, lack of enamel, cervical constriction, short roots, and initially shell teeth, and later pulp canal obliteration can be seen. Histologically, dentin contains few large irregularly arranged dentinal tubules, and pulp is almost filled with irregular dentin. The DJ is smooth without scallops. First, DI has classified uh, by the shield according to the phenotypes. Type 1 associated with osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a bone disorder. Uh, and type 2 not associated with osteogenesis imperfecta. And type 3 brandy wine type isolated in Southern Maryland. 
But the current classification, uh, they have excluded type one in the shield classification and type two and three respectively become type one and two. Regarding the management, early diagnosis should be essential as these patients are suffering from various problems, emotional, functional, and aesthetic. And managing a patient with discolored teeth and uh, with compromised tooth structures is really challenging as they require lifelong treatments. Management depends on mainly age, amount of tooth destruction, and level of patient cooperation. It should be a multidisciplinary approach. There are several treatment objects, objectives, such as preserve vitality, form, and size of the teeth, improve the aesthetic and psychological well-being, and maintain OVD, provide a functional dentition, maintain arch length, and allow fa facilitate the eruption of permanent teeth, and allow normal growth of facial bonds. Let's see the management protocol depend on the age. First, primary dentition. If the child patient presented you with uh, discoloration and if you have diagnosed it as a dental genesis imperfecta, first you should exclude osteogenesis imperfecta. It's called a fragile bone disease. In that case, you have to, we have to investigate uh, bone pain and any bone abnormality and uh, uh, any uh, blue sclera and short stature. And uh, we have to do necessary referrals for the confirm the diagnosis and do the management. And then behavior management. As all these patients are very small children, uh, they require general anesthesia other than sedation for the management. And they need to uh, come repeatedly from the uh, faraway places. And the family members, mainly parents, siblings are affected. And they are socially and aesthetically uh, depressed. And uh, so they need a good behavior management and psychological support. And also, as the patients are having a very little amount of tooth substance remain, we have to implement all the prevention protocols such as plaque control, fluoride therapy, and remineralizing agents like that. And they need lifelong follow-up. In the primary dentition, if the uh, cases are very severe, we can implement two stage of treatment under general anesthesia. Stage one, with the eruption of these, we can put uh, preformed stainless steel crowns over these, and incisors can be restored with composite. In stage two, with the eruption of ease, we can put, uh, put SS crowns over ease and canine can be uh, done with composite. Other than uh, composite restorations for the incisor teeth, we can go for strip crowns and SS crowns with composite faces. In moderate cases, we can go for directly one stage treatment at the about of three years of age, putting SS crowns over uh, primary molars and canine, canines and incisors restored with composite. This is uh, case one, one and a half year old boy presented us. Uh, as you can see, poorly calcified teeth, discolored smooth, but still teeth are erupting. So uh, we have uh, implemented all the prevention protocols and patient kept under review without doing any invasive procedure at this moment. The case two, this is a two and a half year old girl presented to us. As you can see, uh, there are severe uh, discoloration, enamel chip of tooth there, and, but relatively enamel intact in upper and lower V's and extensive decays in lower D's. Uh, you can see in preoperative pre DPT, uh, bulbous crown, cervical convergence, root canal obliteration, and short roots. There we have done uh, SS crowns over primary molars and kept under review. Regarding the mixed dentition, we can uh, do extraction of severe worn of primary teeth and maintain space until eruption of the permanent teeth. And then protection of posterior teeth from wear. In that case, we can do SS crown on primary molars, but we do not rush into do uh, SS crowns on permanent molars as they are still erupting and do not involve in maintain OVD. In that case, we can just observe with prophylaxis composite restorations or fissure sealants along. If they are severely involved only, we can go for SS crowns at the late, later stage. This is such a case, eight years old girl presented us. Uh, she was reluctant to go to school and she was suffering from a repeated stomach ache due to insufficient mastication. As you can see, all the primary teeth are involved with severe tooth there, but uh, permanent teeth, sixes and lower incisors relatively, uh, the enamel is intact there. And uh, you can see the micro abscesses over upper labial uh, region associated with uh, upper anterior teeth. Uh, the DPT shows you even the six permanent teeth are having a cervical convergence, bulbous crown, and almost all teeth are having pulp canal obliteration. Ground section shows, showed you that uh, <laughs> lack of enamel and scanty dentine tubules in the dentine. 
these are post of photographs after three years of follow up. Uh, I have uh, we have done all the extraction of upper anterior teeth associated with microabscesses as the as doing endodontic treatment was difficult here. So, so it facilitates the eruption of permanent teeth and the primary molars was were secured with SS crowns. You can see the permanent teeth are relatively less affected than primary teeth. Uh, you can see the even the erupting uh, permanent incisors also having my uh, pulp canal obliteration. Uh, patient was uh, stable up to now and patient kept on uh, regular close reviews. Regarding the permanent dentition about adolescents, we can do composite veneers on incisors and canines and composite buildups on premolars and molars can be restored with SS crowns or gold on list. And if the teeth are exfoliated or extracted, we can go for dentures for space maintained until we are going for uh, fixed restorative options at near future. This is such a case, 12 years old girl presented us with severe discoloration, poor oral hygiene, and uh, decays in certain teeth. This is a special case that we have diagnosis osteogenesis imperfecta uh, in this patient. Actually patient was difficult to walk, and those are the bone radiograph of these patients. And we have done necessary reference. And now patient is uh, on uh, proper medical and surgical care. Uh, we have done uh, SS crowns over sixes and uh, fissure sealants only, uh, fissure sealants in uh, sevens. And uh, depend on the patient aesthetic demand, we are planning to do composite videos on the uh, incisor teeth. About the adulthood, uh, almost all cases are associated with severe tooth wear. Yeah? In that case, it requires full mouth rehabilitation with reorganized approach, restorations with composite buildups, metal or gold on less, and crowns. If only the root, roots are remain, we can go for over dangers. And if the teeth are missing due to exfoliation or extraction, we can go for implant retained crowns or removal dangers or implant retained dangers in the complete edentulous cases. This is such a case, a uh, 45 year old male. Actually, this is a father of one of the uh, children I have showed earlier. He was treated once at the age of 25 years of age uh, with extensive uh, restorative work. But now all these restorations are failing and almost all teeth are getting mobile. So we have extracted all the uh, poor prognostic teeth and uh, replaced with uh, re removable acrylic dentures. With that, moving into the discussion, Actually, uh, management of DI patients are really challenging. One is uh, because uh, the altered uh, comp uh, chemical composition of the enamel and dentine uh, leads bonding problem. Actually, the other hybrid layer thickness is reduced there. So we can, uh, to overcome that, we can remove the enamel that will uh, crack away future and go to the bonding to the dentine. Or in less severe cases, we can remove the prismatic layer of the enamel and expose the prismatic layer and do the bonding. Uh, even if they are failing also, we can do simple uh, sedative GIC restorations. And even the smallest size of the available preform SS crowns will, not suitable, uh, will be not suitable for these small crowns. So it needs uh, extensive adjustments of the preform crowns. And cervical convergence, there's a cervical undercut. So it needs extensive preparation and uh, adjustments in the preform crowns also. And there's a high risk of getting exposed to the pulp during the uh, mechanical preparation and tooth and uh, tooth decays. And the thin, short, fragile roots leads uh, mobility of the teeth and uh, exfoliation one day. And uh, exposed dentine and uh, uh, pulpal canal obliteration leads to uh, compromise the pulp circulation and it leads recurrent infection and associate with periapical infection with microabscesses. But doing endodontic treatments is also difficult there because of pulp canal obliteration and if, uh, or, uh, altered anatomical features and uh, uh, restoration of endodontical treated teeth also uh, difficult following endodontics. Uh, and also uh, doing periapical surgery is also very difficult uh, in these cases as they, are, they have short roots. In that case, uh, sometimes periapical curatage will work in certain cases. With that, I will conclude my presentation. Early diagnosis and interceptive treatments need to improve occlusion and aesthetic in the DI patients. And long-term follow-up requires to minimize the complications. I would offer my sincere gratitude, Dr. Gaini Kure, and Dr. Sumdhara Snaiger for sharing their cases with me and to these Edison patients.
these are my references and thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr eknaik for sticking to the time again and uh, now the presentation is open for discussion dr eknaik uh, you spoke about uh, using early preventive measures in this patient uh, in this patients so can i know what are the preventive measures uh, that uh, are there any special preventive measures used in these patients rather than the usual fluoride therapy and all yeah uh, because these patients normally enamel is crack away so exposed dentin very susceptible to tooth wear and tooth decays and periodontal disease uh, the sensitivity is like, uh, less in these di patient so we can uh, implement all the prevention protocols to preserve the tooth substance that are remain so we can go for plaque control methods that is a mecha mechanical plaque control with brushing and interdental cleaning it's like that and chemical plaque control uh, with chlorhexidine like that and we can uh, uh, implement all the fluoride therapy home care fluoride therapy like fluoride gel fluoride mouth rinses fluoridated toothpaste and professional uh, fluoride therapy as well like fluoride varnish application and remineralizing agents like uh, tooth mousse as you know we can implement all uh, these things and diet therapy mainly uh, reduce the cariogenic diets and all that we can uh, arrange the professional dental uh, reviews uh like uh, as considering they are high risk patients we can arrange three uh, three months or less, even less than that we can arrange the interval review in, uh, period, uh, appointments for these patients and kept uh, close uh, reviews any more questions there are no any other questions uh, thank you dr eknaik for your sir. presentation yeah. we'll move on to the last presentation of the free, uh, free paper session uh, presentation title is comprehensive management of a patient with non syndromic oligodontia authors are ss kalubovil rm sdk ranatunga and iw apd palipana and the presenting author is uh, ss kalubovil Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to present a case report: comprehensive management of a patient with non-syndromic oligodontia. Oligodontia is defined as congenital absence of six or more teeth except third molars. This is a rare occurrence, and when the a patient is having oligodontia, uh, there's an increased risk of syndromic involvement. This is more prevalent among females, and according to the uh, decreasing order. mandibular second premolars are the uh, most commonly affected teeth except third molars then maxillary lateral incisors maxillary second premolars and then mandibular incisors congenital absence of uh, central incisors first permanent molars and canines are extremely rare uh, there are several other oral conditions that is associated with oligodontia which makes the management of this patient very difficult uh, those are microdontia malformed teeth delayed and ectopic eruptions enamel hyperplasia and because of the absence of teeth there will be lack of alveolar bone development tilting drifting and ov eruption of remaining teeth and intra occlusion of retained primary teeth uh, the lack of keratinized mucosa uh, also compromise future prosthetic treatment uh, replacement and uh, some other uh, malocclusions also associated with this patient such as reduced maxillary mandibular plane angle reduced lower facial height and class 3 skeletal pattern it has a severe impact on the quality of life of these affected individuals uh, and uh, one study reported uh, 88% of severe hyperdontia patients exhibit functional limitations related to mastication and speech but still the prime motivating factor for the patients who seek dental treatment is aesthetic one study reported the missing teeth without replacement reduces the physical index of quality of life to the same extent as uh, cancer and the renal diseases 
the oligodontia management depend upon the severity or pattern of missing teeth associated other dental and systemic problems attitudes of the patients affordability and availability of facilities for, for successful management we need the multidisciplinary team consisting of general dental practitioner orthodontist re restorative dentist specialist omf surgeon and several other disciplines the goals are to preserve what is remaining and prevent undesirable effects of missing teeth restoration of aesthetic function and provide psychosocial benefits and ultimate goal is to elevate oral health related quality of life the management options can be broadly classified as no treatment orthodontic treatment alone restorative modification of existing teeth orthodontic and restorative joint management and replacement options are removable dentures resin bonded bridges conventional bridges implants auto transplantation or combination of all above moving on to the case report a 23 year old male referred from orthodontic unit for replacement of missing teeth he has been treated jointly at orthodontic and restorative combined clinic due to missing permanent teeth and over retained deciduous teeth uh, he was wearing a, a lower acrylic removal partial denture replacing lower missing teeth for 8 years due to social reasons he requested immediate aesthetic improvement as he is a third year undergraduate student of uh, a university uh, generally he has nothing abnormal extraordinarily he had class 1 skeletal pattern with average fmpa and low smile line intraorally uh, he had 12 missing teeth except third molars uh, those are upper right 2 3 4 upper left 2 3 5 uh, both lower uh, canines and all incisors uh, over retained deciduous teeth upper right b c d and le uh, left upper b c were grade 3 mobile central incisors were large in size and spaces existed between uh, deciduous over retained teeth but permanent teeth were well aligned with good uh, posterior occlusion the lower denture was uh, unesthetic with uh, worn teeth and discoloration. Uh, he had good level of oral hygiene and the first photograph shows pre-orthodontic study models. Uh, you can see the large median diastema which was corrected using orthodontic fixed appliances. The, the second uh, photograph shows the diagnostic wax we constructed during the prosthetic planning phase. This is the uh, DPT taken just before the debonding. You can see good level of uh, bone height in the edentulous spaces. So with these findings, the diagnosis was made as non-syndromic polyodontia with 12 missing teeth, expect third molars, and over-retained upper right BCD and upper left BC. He was partially dented. The upper arch was Kennedy class 3 modification 2, and low arch Kennedy class 4. The treatment plan was made to educate the patient and since he requested immediate aesthetic improvement, extraction of mobile deciduous teeth with provision of immediate upper denture and lower acrylic dentures and investigation for the uh, definitive replacement options, uh, then definitive prosthetic treatment, TV and maintenance. The first photograph shows uh, after provision of the immediate uh, upper denture and new acrylic lower denture, patient was very happy with the aesthetics uh, with uh, using this uh, as a guideline, we constructed a radiological stain with clear acrylic. As radiological markers, we used uh, alginate, uh, so, uh, GIC combined with amalgam alloy uh, to uh, provide a radiopaque hue. And we instructed the patient to uh, wear the radiological stain while the CBCT is taken. In the third one, you can see the CBCT uh, screenshots. Uh, the upper arch, uh, there was adequate bone height and width, except in 2-5 region, where the close proximity to the maxillary sinus limited the bone height for placement of an implant. Uh, all along the lower edentulous stage, labial lingual width was very narrow. The uh, lingual and uh, labial plates were almost touching together. With this, we discussed several treatment options and uh, plan to provide implant supported bridge for 1, 2, 1, 3, and 1, 4 area and implant supported single crowns for 2, 2, 2, 3. Uh, since implant placement is impossible, 
in uh, two five region a resin bonded cantilever bridge was uh, provided and for the low arch uh, the bone width was not adequate to place implants and after discussing with the patient a metal partial denture was planned for the low arch so this top three photographs were taken during the uh, surgical phase of implant placement uh, we modified the same radiological stent for a surgical stent and uh, implant placement was prosthetically driven the lower radiograph was taken after implant placement showing satisfactory implant placement this is during the uh, prosthetic phase uh, the first one is uh, gingiva collar formation around the implant pictures and uh, implant uh, impression was obtained uh, in the reseating impression technique and the third photograph is the wax pattern of the lower metal partial denture here you can appreciate the post operative outcome with uh, patient had very uh, good aesthetics and occlusion is also good and he is very happy with the final outcome here you can see the happy smile of the patient post operatively discussion this is a, uh, this case is a rare presentation he had 12 missing permanent teeth including all canines and he is non syndromic but had minimum associated other oral conditions making the management little bit easier and he was managed with orthodontic restorative joint approach and 12 missing teeth were replaced using multiple prosthetic replacement modalities so implant supported bridge was provided with two uh, implant supported single crowns and cantilever resin bonded bridge and finally lower metal partial denture dental implants are considered as gold standard replacement option for hyperdontia patients as uh, they uh, offer many advantages over other treatment options such as uh, they are uh, most biologically conservative and provide better support retention for the prosthesis better aesthetic special in space arches and it has the highest survival rates uh, because of the minimal invasive nature and the advancement of the adhesive techniques and materials now the resin bonded bridges are considered as a first line of treatment option especially for young patients with large pulps and healthy teeth and offers predictable long term option for tooth replacement and a recent study demonstrated a 91% of 5 year survival rates of resin bonded bridges cantilever designs offer more survival rates compared to fixed fixed designs Uh, where the uh, anatomical constraint are there we can use uh, removable partial dentures acrylic or metal either as interim or definitive treatment options uh, in long dentural spans uh, we can use this and it is relatively inexpensive and we can use these to replace bulk of lost soft tissues as well as hard tissues Uh, let me conclude the presentation by saying the presence of full complement of teeth is essential to form a confident powerful smile which expresses the inner joy the management of patients with oligodontia is challenging so it requires the multidisciplinary team approach the most critical step is the uh, treatment planning step and you have to spend more time on that uh, since the old prosthesis have a finished lifetime we have to review and maintain us this patient uh, because it is very important and with successful uh, management we can significantly improve this affected individuals life thank you thank you very much uh, dr kalu govila for your presentation and now uh, the presentation is open for discussion now dr kalubo will uh, now in your presentation you elaborated on uh, the information of a patient who uh, came across so now how often we found in our clinics this type of uh, patient is it uh, rare uh, so sometimes uh, when uh, hyperdontia is mild uh, patient may not know about the condition but usually with uh, severe hyperdontia patient presented due to mainly due to aesthetic reason they will present into either restorative clinics or orthodontic clinics 
and with that we see a lot of patients since we are working in a specialist institutes but uh, in sri lanka uh, it is the, the prevalence is comparable to uh, the western countries there are studies even though it is not that uh, uh, commonly done uh, we have the same presentation so what are the uh, i mean implications of this case study for your future practice uh, the most important thing is uh, we have to uh, work collaboratively with other specialties to uh, get optimum result even in this case uh, because of orthodontic uh, input and orthodontic help we could provide a better results uh, with our rest restorative work and uh, other thing is the plan we had to spend a lot of time and uh, for the planning phase rather than just doing the treatment uh, we have to plan it properly so we can uh, do it easily and achieve more stable results any more questions there are no any questions uh, thank you very much thank you dr kalubovila for your presentation so that concludes the free paper session uh, for this uh, 89th year annual scientific sessions of the sri lanka dental association now this free paper session included uh, four presentations two of them are case reports and two of them are case series um there weren't any um uh, research presentations uh, this time quite unusual and uh, there's one point to emphasize that uh, answering questions handling questions is a part of your presentation so i mean um, audience should be supportive and ask questions during the free paper session and uh, the presenter himself can arrange somebody to ask questions and he himself can give the questions to ask so that you are you are pretty comfortable otherwise the i mean if the uh, audience does not ask any questions then it is the duty of the chair persons to ask questions so in that case chair persons uh, are in trouble that sometimes they have to ask questions from a totally unknown specialty right <laughs> anyway so just keep in mind that uh, it's a part of uh, your presentation uh, handling questions because in evaluation you get marks for that right so thank you very much for all the presenters uh, nice presentations and uh, the best presentation will be selected uh, there is a panel of judges and uh, uh, it will be uh, rewarded uh, during the inauguration ceremony so uh, uh, we will move on to the uh, uh, next uh, presentation before that uh, it is uh, the awarding of the tokens of appreciation i would like to invite the president of the sri lanka dental association uh, dr manil fonseca to give away the certificates uh, to the free paper presenters they know that right they know that uh, Dr. R. Godevitan, Dr. S. M. R. S. Navarat. Dr. E. M. K. Sekanayak, Dr. S. S. Kalubovilan, so the best paper will be awarded at the inauguration ceremony. So we will uh, move on to the next uh, session. Thank you. So we will now move on to the final session of today and uh, to commence the session, may I invite uh, two of our very senior past presidents, Dr. Hilary Kure and Dr. Asoka Munugama to take the chair positions at the head table.
Thank you, Professor Mayak. Uh, the next presentation is going to be by Dr. R. L. Pramit Lienage. Um, he's a consultant oral pathologist at uh, National Dental Hospital uh, here in Colombo. He has got his basic uh, graduation in 2006, and uh, then he has done the postgraduate MD qualification he has obtained in 2013. And also, um, in event of across the higher training, he has obtained FRCP, uh, FRC or PATH, New K. So at the moment, he's working as a consultant oral pathologist in National Dental Hospital. Uh, now it's your turn to make a presentation, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson, sir. And good afternoon. Okay, so I'll touch upon some oral mucosal lesions. So probably I may not cover all aspect. So I choose this topic because so the oral cavity is a very dynamic environment, as you all know. So the mucosa itself as well adjusted to this uh, dynamic environment. So, and also if you see the uh, different lesions appear in the oral cavity, so it, that shows that dynamism. So basically, the, for the ease of diagnostic approach, we can classify them to different categories, but we will never get these uh, broad individual entities because sometimes, so same disease process, you will have all sorts of appearances, all sorts of colors, all sorts of te textures. So I'll be discussing basically white lesions, then moving to red and white lesions and erythematous lesions. But there are other entities, so it will come up in the oral cavity, in yellow, yellow mucosal entities, like for the spots and other things. And also there are pigmented lesions. So, so if you take the white lesions of the oral mucosa, so basically we can consider a few, few topics. So they can be developmental or hereditary. And then there are few conditions. And also there we get reactive white lesions uh, such as frictional keratosis, and some are due to various irritants we take into the mouth. There are immunologically mediated diseases, also we can give rise to white lesions, some, some are these oral lichen penis, DLE, and graft versus host disease, but these lesions also can present as red and white lesions, as well as purely red lesions. Then finally, we'll touch upon the oral potentially malignant disorders. So if you go into white lesions, so what are the developmental in origin and all the hereditary lesions, but leukedema is doesn't consider as developmental or hereditary, but it usually now people think it's a normal variation as well, because you mostly see in these lesions in blacks. And so it is a diffuse white appearance, white to gray appearance in the oral mucosa. So if you see the uh, clinical picture, you will see some wrinkling, and also it's diffuse and it's usually bilateral. And the interesting thing is, so what if you stretch the mucosa in this picture, you have the gray white appearance. If you stretch mucosa, this lesion will disappear. So that is a very good clue to diagnosis. So, but usually you don't need histopathology to diagnose this condition, but if you do histopathological investigation. So you might see a thick paracretin layer and also this uh, edema of the spinous layer and as well as acanthosis, so elongation of reti ridges. So next one, I would like to consider the white sponge nemus. So these conditions are very rare, but sometimes you may encounter in your practice. So in developmental land, these hereditary lesions, what you need to remember is they mostly appear in early age. So not in all the adult, unless patient is, does not notice it, notice it. So this is a white sponge nemus is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. And it has a high degree of penetrance. Basically, the, the are kids or other next generation, mostly most of, most of them got could get it. And so basically the mutation is in the keratin 4 and 13 genes. So as I said, so we'll see in the early life, 
live food if tilapia and the early live live food so mostly they are asymptomatic and they are thick white plaques so this could be the clinical appearance with thick white plaques so it is bilateral so again white sponge nemus and if you do the histology so there will be acanthosis parakeratosis and very interesting uh, uh, keratin tone of filament around uh, nuclei of uh, spinous layer so that this is a characteristic feature of this disease so there's another one another one we call the hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis so again it's autosomal dominant disorder so why i am discussing these things because when you are talk about opmd so we need to exclude these uh, diseases before coming to your diagnosis so and this case you will get ocular lesions as well so in, when you have a patient with uh, this kind of white lesions the oral cavity especially young patients you better to look for the whole body so look for the areas i see whether is it a syndrome related so so the mucosal lesions could be like this white plaques and also remember these patients can get eye lesions and if you do the histopathology we get the uh, acanthotic elongated uh, retriges and numerous dyskeratotic cells you know these are separated from adjacent cells these brightly eosinophilic cells they are called dyskeratotic cells the next one we call the pachyonychia congenita again this is uh, autosomal dominant inherited as an autosomal dominant trait so these all these most of diseases are due to mutations in keratin keratin genes and so in this patient pachyonychia congenita you will see changes in the nail and palms and soles and also you will get oral uh, lesions like leukoplakia so this pachyonychia congenita you will see the uh, underlying the nail bed there will be increase uh, accumulation of keratin and that due to that the free edge of the uh, nail will raise and also there will be marked palmar palmar plantar keratosis like in here plantar keratosis and might get oral lesions as well the next one we want i want to discuss is dyskeratosis keratosis congenita so this is this is a potentially malignant disorder uh, and different to other entities so this is indicated as an x linked recessive trait so usually similar in to other cases it appears uh, usually in before 10 years and uh, this case so lesions can progress to Uh, epithelial dysplasia then to squamous cell carcinoma so we consider this as a potentially malignant disorder okay now i i finished this i have finished the uh, developmental categories so i'm moving on to reactive oral white lesions so why we get reactive lesions because in the oral cavity with patients we see a lot of para functional habits so these habits can give rise to all sort of keratotic lesions so they can be occlusal trauma so those can be due to purpose you know the habits uh, nibbing chewing mucosa right so there are different names i have given uh, for those so we have mosicacio bacarum and we have there are people who chew the tongue and lip so this is we call linear alba so this is along the occlusal pain it's due to chronic occlusal trauma so nothing it's not pathogenic so you don't need to worry about that so basically the habit of be uh, buccal mucosal chewing mosicacio bacarum so you get this type of huge lesions and uh, these things you may see in your practice and so if you do histology by suspecting uh, any other leukoplakic lesion you will see mark thickness increase of the spinous layer and also surface you will see a lot of keratin and you can see the trauma inserted by teeth and here very ragged surface in the sur surface and some macular degeneration of the surface epithelial cells 
and some bacteria colonies and we don't see any underlying inflammation and no candida in it. So these kind of lesions also can be overhanging of a tooth and giving rise to keratosis in retromolar region. Again, when you, whenever you see white lesion, there will be increased thickness of the epithelium and the keratin, parakeratin or orthokeratin layer. So that is why it looks white. And basically these lesions do not show any dysplastic changes. They have nice uh, basal layer down there and nice precursor layer, then nicely maturing into uh, parakeratin or autokeratin. This is Moshikasho linguarum. They say that some people chew the tongue. So, so this is one of the other thing. And also, so these are the differential diagnosis. So some of these will appear in the uh, next slides. And also the oral hairy leukoplakia. So this lesion may, somebody may suspect it could be due to oral leukoplakia. So that's a differential. See the oral, okay, I'll touch on later. And other than these, uh, those cases, we have some irritant because we take into the mouth a lot of uh, chemicals and you know, a lot of products and toothpaste, so many drinks with attitudes. So those in some patients, those things can cause uh, contact stomatitis actually. So these contact stomatitis, those lesions can be either keratotic because of peeling of the, of the mucosa or those can be ulcerative and present as uh, red lesions and mixed pattern. So a few of those I will discuss. So this is uh, superficial stuffing of oral mucosa due to some ingredients in uh, toothpaste. And also if you do the histology, you will see the separation of paracaratin layer. And also this, because of this contact hypersensitivity, we, we will see a lot of lichenoid reactions. So when we say lichenoid reaction, mean we will see the lichenoid inflammatory pattern. So, so main lesions we see in our uh, in oral cavities, amalgam, uh, due to amalgam. So, and also then there are conditions that can give rise to uh, lichenoid reaction with the cinnamon flavoring agents. So this is the amalgam related lichenoid reaction. So lichenoid reactions are usually one-sided, as been one-sided and related to the tooth. And lichenoid reactions are due to, you know, can be due to various reasons and drugs and all that. So there are some differences in uh, histology to uh, see uh, lichenoid reaction with uh, compare with lichen planus. Uh, but sometimes we cannot separate at all just only looking at the microscope but so we need a lot of clinical information from you all to separate it from oral lichen planus um, so basically we'll see the dense infiltrate of lymphocyte and sometimes plasma cells with basal cell destruction and the striking thing is in the lichenoid reactions so the inflammatory infiltrate go deep and we'll see the deeper areas we have inflammatory cells And so this is due to cinnamon containing chewing gum. So it looks like lichen planus or lichenoid reaction. And so if you can elucidate, so what are the causes? If you see these same kind of lesions, you might get up, uh, get to know that patient is losing something specific. So that will be very interesting for us to know as well, because so if you see this lesion be quite different uh, to other lichenoid reactions, because they have, a, a, we call it an intercellular edema can spaces in the in between cells and lymphocyte migrate on the uh, on the in the within the epithelium so these type of features can be seen in the cinnamon related oral mucosal lesions so again uh, as i said earlier so white lesion can be due to immunologically mediated diseases so so those are the oral lichen planus and GLD and graft versus, versus host disease. So as you all know, oral lichen planus is a chronic inflammatory disorder. So it, is, it has classic presentations and some are very rare presentations. So if you see the pathogenesis is basically the T cell mediated basal cell destruction. So CD8 cytotoxic T cells, they will destruct the basal cell layer. So there will be atrophy of the epithelium. And due to you know the basal cells, we are 
and we have a lot of pigments so, uh, and these pigments will deliver into underlying corium and macrophages will engulf those pigments and it will give to melanin incontinence. So we'll see a lot of pigmentation with lichen planus, right? As well as, so there are different clinical patterns. So it can be linear, reticular, so papula and all sorts of different patterns. And uh, so it's something like this to take. So this is the, uh, what you see is classic pattern, reticular lichen planus. And this is the skin lesion. So this is, anybody can recognize this lesion. And, uh, but this type of lesion can be changed into erythematous lesion because of candidal superinfection. And sometimes patient complain of uh, burning sensation due to candidal superinfection in these type of lesions. So this is one of the lesion I said, because of the uh, melanin incontinence, uh, you get a lot of pigmentation. So this is after uh, steroid treatment, tropical steroid treatment, there's some reduction in the whitish appearance, but, but pigments are still there. So this is not a melanoma. So this is due to that pigment incontinence. And also very interesting uh, uh, lesion, this plaque type lichen planus. So, so many people sometimes get um, scared, can be like uh, leukoplakia or it can be with dysplasia. But the main thing is we get, we rarely get um, cancers, oral cancers in the dosum of the tongue. So this is the plaque type like on penis. So, and also we will get atrophic lesions. So as I said, you know, the, we can't exactly say this is only the uh, white lesion we get in like on penis. So there's always, always overlap and they are very erosive ulcerative areas. So we need to, then we need to think of, think about uh, vesiculobular diseases as well. This nice papular variant. So we have papu papules of um, whitish papules, but in, in between here, you can see some expressions. And then this is skin lesions with papules. So moving on to histopathology, basically you will see nice band-like inflammatory infiltrate with lymphocyte in the lichen penis, but we occasionally we see plasma cells as well, but infiltrated basically in classic cases. So it's, it's, oh, it's in the upper layer, it doesn't go down here. Right. So if you go to the interface, so muco, mucosa and the underlying connective tissue, you will see the destruction of basal cells and only you will see the um, stratum is fine or some of these prickle cells are sitting on the basement membrane layer. And also there will be apoptotic bodies and melanin incontinence. So, so there's another condition called, called, um, called graft versus host disease. Basically graft versus host disease, what will happen is the the donor, uh, donor cells attack um, the recipient cells, right? So this is basically happening in the bone marrow transplant with the hematological malignancies. So the appearance is very similar to like containers. So the, we can diagnose, cannot diagnose it under the microscope. It's basically depend on the clinical information given to us. Moving on to lupus erythematosus. So lupus erythematosus is a very broad disease with a very broad spectrum. And also we have, they have, it has a lot of systemic manifestations and all sorts of complications, renal, cardiac. So it can be, can just to know, or can be systemic or cutaneous. So systemic form is very serious. So these diseases can give rise to um, lesions like mela rash in here, this is SLE. So, and also the inner palate, red and white lesion, usually central red area with peripheral whitish lesion. And something like this. So we have central red area, then the peripheral whitish area and something like this as well. So we, Okay, just to show you that few cases, so those immunologically mediated diseases can give rise to oral red and white lesions. So moving on to white lesion, I discussed, but some are, some are with overlapping features. So then moving to red and white lesions. So when you talk about red and white lesions, so we can't forget uh, candidiasis, right? That's a common thing in oral cavity. So there are other things, erythrolicopakia, DLE and lichen penis, as I discussed, all those things can appear as red and white lesions as well. 
So just a uh, uh, brief description of candidiasis. So it's a very common, it's, it's, it's in our common cell. So it, it, it's as a, it's a dimorphic fungus because it has um, hyper form and the yeast form. And, and whenever we have a disturbance to our oral cavity due to steroid use or uh, saliva issues, you know, dry mouth and all sorts of things, whatever the reason, so they will colonize in the oral mucosa. So they will become hyper form and invade into oral mucosa and give rise to all sorts of lesions. So if you take the candida lesions or clinical presentations, so we have different categories. So we can see pseudomembranous candidiasis and we have erythematous candidiasis under which we have acute atrophic candidiasis and median rhomboid glossitis, right? Also, with, which is called central papillary atrophy. And we have other things, chronic hyperlastic candidiasis and angular chelitis. So, so a few of those, so if you take pseudomembranous candidiasis, so from your undergraduate date, so you know how to diagnose, so we call it as oral thrush. And we have plaques, whitish plaques, and it is erythematous base. So this will be the classic appearance of pseudomembranous candidiasis that can be due to steroid use or any other cause. And if you can get a soap from this and send it to us on a slide, so we can just easily see this uh, with the PAS stain, we can see you don't need to do biopsies. I can see so many hypae. And if you do a biopsy, you will see numerous candidal hypae. You know, they are invading in the epithelium. Even having a one single hypae, we consider as a patho pathognomic. So moving on to chronic hyperplastic candida candidiasis. So basically we see in adult males and some are smokers. And so mostly in post commissural area. So it will be something like that. So this type of lesion, we actually need to do biopsy and see whether there is a purely candida related or purely dysplastic. And sometimes, you know, the white lesion, this type, uh, even in a leukopakia, there can be a candida super infection. So that will give us a erroneous message that because of presence of candida may take some cellular changes. So we might think, okay, well, this is dysplasia. So what we will always do is, so we just treat the lesion first and get rid of the candida and then see whether they are, then we get an, another biopsy and see whether those changes are still there. So it is purely dysplastic or not. So if you see the biopsy, uh, chronic hyperplastic candidiasis lesion, so you'll see uh, elongated retriges, very broad. And the, if you do see some, you may see some few microbes with neutrophils. So then what will we do is we do DPS, diastase PAS stain, so especially stain, so that will highlight candidal hypae on top of that, on top in the superficial layer. So as I uh, said earlier, see oral hairy leukopenia. So earlier we thought it is basically when you see, whenever you see oral hairy leukopenia, it is uh, uh, related to AIDS, HIV. But now we have seen the, there are cases reported in oral hair leukopenia in immunocompromised patients, as well as there are very few normal patients also. So this is all usually occur in lateral board of the tongue. And if you do the biopsy, you will see nice, uh, the kind of um, elongated retis, but parakeratosis and that can, below the line of parakeratin, we will see some white vacuolated cells. But to make the diagnosis, and other thing is because this people, if you do a PAS in here, there will be a lot of candidal hype, but we don't see anything in the underlying, uh, no inflammatory response. That is because they are immunocompromised. So there won't be any response. But we can do, this is little EBV. So we can do ish in situ hybridization for EBV, ERNA. So, so these will be virus particles will be highlighted here. Okay, moving on to uh, erythematous oral mucosal lesions. So it can be due to various conditions. So using dentures and uh, all, there's a list of things, right? We'll see one by one, few of those. So if you see denture stomatitis, you recently also, you see one of the lecturers show those uh, lesions. So basically in the palatal mucosa, 
and due to various reasons and can be uh, suboptimal fit, poor danger hygiene and nocturnal wear and so on. So this is classic presentation. You will see the nice margin of the denture, denture base. So I think it is very, can be very easily diagnosed in this case. So there is, there's another condition called benign migratory grossitis. You, you see in young patients at younger age, and it is a chronic inflammatory disorder. So it's, it's, it has a classic presentation. So multiple erythematous areas, and those erythematous areas are due to um, atrophy of filiform papillae. You get filiform papillae on the surface of those surface of the tongue. So other interesting thing is these, uh, these lesions vary in size, right? And also these can be, this can affect not only the tongue. So we can get in the soft palate and also in the lower lip. And also people say it is more sometimes associated with fissured tongue also. And if you do biopsy, you will see a lot of microabscesses on the top, but there are no candida. Whenever we see microabscesses, we think neutrophil microabscesses, we think, okay, there will be candida, but in this case, no candida, and you will see some elongation of retiridges, but loss of piliform papillae on the surface. Then erythematous candidiasis, one of the type of candidiasis I was talking about earlier. So, Again, what will happen is, so basically it is prominent area. If you take, it is erythematous. You don't see whitish lesions. And uh, so this is, can be due to uh, several reasons, you all know. And there are two types. So we call acute atrophic candidiasis. So acute atrophic candidiasis, that is acute, presentation is acute. So it is basically due to antibiotics. So it is also called antibiotic so mouth. And also other one is median rhomboid glossitis, right? Uh, so that is also called central papillary atrophy. So this is the acute atrophic candidiasis, antibiotic so mouth, because initial this is appears after the uh, dose of antibiotics. And so the other condition, central papillary atrophy, and also it happens in the midline of the dorsal surface of the tongue. So it's well demarcated. And uh, to make it differentiated from benign migratory glossitis, so the, these lesions don't migrate, don't change the shape. And also if you do candida, so you will see candidal hype in these lesions. And also the, what they say is the benign migratory grossitis, you, can see, you will see nice yellowish border. So that border is not there in other conditions. So then another category, so we call it descommative gingivitis. So descommative gingivitis is not, not a disease itself. So it has a lot of causes, but it's a clinical presentation. So it can be due to uh, erosive lichen planus, lichenoid reactions, and foreign body gingivitis, all sometimes can be due to contact stomatitis, and can be due to other immunological uh, vesiculobulous disorders. So this is the presentation. So whenever you see this, so you need to think about a lot of factors and come into differential diagnosis and wherever necessary, you need to do investigations. Okay, so moving to so all these things we talk about, uh, you know, related to different things. So we basically talk about in every books and journals, we talk about oral potential malignant disorders. So as the cancer is the one of the commonest uh, in, among in men in Sri Lanka, so we need to do about, know about oral potential malignant disorders. But thing is these definitions or sort of diagnostic criteria are keep on changing. So it's, it's difficult to keep track on all those things. So this is a very latest definition in 2020. So one of our experts is in, also in this group. So what they say is any oral mucosal abnormality that has uh, that is associated with the statistically in increased risk of cancer development. So oral potentially malignant disorder is a new name now. So earlier we described it as a pre-cancer and uh, pre-cancerous conditions. So why it is oral potentially malignant disorder. So I will elaborate a little bit later. So, 
So these are the previous definitions. So latest definition is in the article still, it is not in the WHO book. So the latest in this, we have clinical presentation that carry increased risk of development of cancer. So it can be in a normal mucosa or it can be in a defined uh, lesion. So this is the 2017 in fourth edition, but fifth edition would consist the previous one. So why they have changed the terminology earlier? We you know that keep on changing. Why, why is that? So earlier we thought of precancer lesion and conditions. So why they want to change? So why they call earlier, why they call it precancer? Because so they have seen that these clinical presentations can lead to uh, present as oral cancer. So these clinical presentation that we see as a pre-cancer will be going to cancer. So they, they thought, okay, this is definitely going to cancer, right? And also if you see the histology of some, some of pre-cancerous lesions and those features, cytology and architectural features, you will see in the malignancies as well. So this is very fair enough to consider, okay, these lesion definitely going to cancer, right? And also genetic, genetical changes, we see in those dysplastic lesions will appear in the oral cancer as well. But the problem is when you say pre-cancer, it comes before cancer, right? So this is that, that means so it definitely go into cancer. So, but that is not. So uh, when we say the pre-cancer, so they have two type of conditions and lesions, but at the end of the day, what they decide was, uh, although we say pre-cancer, all of these lesions doesn't go into cancer, right? And there are some changes. So due to these changes, there's an increased risk of cancer development. So there's increased potential. So what, because of that, we say, okay, these are potentially malignant disorders. So these are not pre-cancer. And they move, so they have um, dropped pre-cancerous lesions and conditions. The concept, the conditions, they say generalized state of um, risk of cancer development. But, but when whatever, in, but when they, we are in the oral mucosa, if you see a single uh, potential uh, pre-cancerous lesion, that means that there's a risk of development of cancer anywhere in the oral cavity. So that is because the carcinogens exposed into whole oral cavity, not to that particular area. So because of that, so they have dropped the, that classification. Now people consider this as potentially malignant disorder. So there are a list of things so few of those I will touch upon. So etiology, basically you all know, so tobacco and aricanat. But tobacco, please remember, we have now different forms of tobacco available in market, very serious, actually chewing, with different chewing form, powdered form and different mix, mixtures in our Sri Lanka as well. So aricanat in combination in alone, it can cause a cancer or OPMD. And there are a few minor cases reported due to HPV. So why, so when we're talking about oral, epithelial dis, uh, oral potential malignance, we talk about oral epithelial dysplasia. So why we are talking about oral epithelial dysplasia? Because what, what we want to know is when, whenever we see a oral lesion in the oral cavity, we want to know what will happen to it, whether it will progress to cancer or it, whether it will regress. So to do that, currently what we have is the uh, look for oral epithelial dysplasia that is under the microscope. So what we are going to look at is the, the architecture of the epithelium and the cytological changes. So that is the most reliable method we have, but it has, it inherits a lot of issues as well. So these are the changes we look for, but thing is this list keep on expanding. But the currently, I personally think we need other markers, not only these um, light microscopic studies, we need to add some genetic component to it or any other markers, because otherwise this is very complicated because individual features, we cannot relate to specific category. So we consider all of these and we give a grading, depending on the where, uh, where it reside, you know, whether low one third, upper one third, something like that. So this is the latest, so they'll be, this will be appearing in the latest WHO book. So they have add so many other minor changes. So this will ag aggravate the, you know, the in, uh, inter-examiner variability and all sort of things. So basically this is what we see in histology in the basal, basal cell layer. If you see some, can you, you may see in slight variation, nuclear size, nuclear shape. You know, so it is only limited to lower layers here. Yeah. So, and the, so this is mild dysplasia and 
and we get some mitosis, abnormally superficial mitosis, mitosis. So all those things we need to look for when you're diagnosing is something more moderate type epithelial dysplasia. So going to severe and severe. End of the day, you will see uh, individual cells separating out from the epithelium and it is invading into the corium, underlying corium that is cancer. So, but remember that all, all OPMD will not progress to cancer. Most of them will regress. So this is how we grade. We have three tier, three -tier system and binary system. So, so if it is limited to lower one third, we call it mild epithelial dysplasia, moderate severe. So we have inherent issues uh, in uh, uh, diagnosing all epithelial dysplasia. We have inter-examiner, intra-examiner variabilities. So we, what we can do is we can reduce this by double reporting. So we can ask uh, my colleague to, okay, you see it and you grade it. So we can come to a consensus that we can do that we, will do, we, we are doing now. And so, and so there are article with conflicting results. So this article says, so we cannot predict uh, malignant transformation with dysplasia grading. So, and so on. And also there are other methods people have sub proposed and we have a binary grading system because the dysplasia grading, most surgeons, they don't like with three tier grading system. When we say, what they ask, when we say moderate. So what we are going to do? So because of that, people have come up with something like high risk and low risk. So basically we say with this high risk lesion, it's a low risk lesion. So if it's high risk, we can do, uh, attend to it, we can remove it. But if it's low risk, we can do follow up. So another thing, some people have done DNA ploidy measurements so or DNA content. And we, they have found that uh, almost um, non dysplastic lesions are deployed. That is similar to our normal cell, uh, 46 chromosomes, right? But uh, so when you have the increase in the uh, degree of dysplasia, so there will be the most cells will be aneuploid. They are not deployed. So we can measure the DNA content. <laughs> so so how do you predict so malignant transformation? So this is a rough guide. So if it is mild dysplasia, only 6% of mild dysplasia cases will transform into malignancy. And again, moderate 18 and severe dysplasia around 14. And also remember the presence of dysplasia means there's a long-term risk. And this entity, so they have newly introduced. So we have seen few cases, not in here. I have seen few cases. So um, this is due to basically due to HPV. So we, you know that we have a separate category of uh, oropharyngeal cancers. They are related to HPV type 16 and 18. They are high risk HPV. And thing is they are very radio sensitive. So they have a different uh, now TNM uh, staging system as well. So this dysplastic lesions are very characteristic about top to bottom changes, very nice paragratin layer. And if you do uh, P16, there's a surrogate marker for HPV. They, that will be positive strongly, and you can do ish in situ hybridization for, for high risk HPV, high risk cocktail actually we get. So we'll, it will be positive. So these are still in the few studies, so we can't say what will happen in the future in these, with these lesions. So basically, you know these conditions, leukoplakia, uh, we have homogeneous and we have non-homogeneous and non-homogeneous ones are more sinister. So it can be speckled. That means speckled means mixed and nodular verrucous and so those are high risk. So these are very homogeneous leukoplakia you will see in the lateral board of the tongue, but lateral board of the tongue is a very risk, high risk site and some kind of erythroleukoplakia, cancer appearing on that. And these are verrucous lesions. So now we recently we are getting some verrucous lesions from especially those who have uh, oral submucous fibrosis. It's a nodular type leukoplakia. Okay, so I'm skipping some slides. So we got off time factor. So remember PVL, so periphery to verrucous leukoplakia. So this is basically diagnosed, actually like we are diagnosing it rest, retrospectively because initially there'll be one white patch, then there'll be another white lesion in another site. So that will definitely progress into uh, cancer. 
So this is a very aggressive form of OPMD and it has a progressive course and older patient, it's okay in older patient and there's a female predominance. So etiology, we don't know. So it's that diagnosing challenging, as I said, it's a mostly retrospective. So erythroplakia, again, it's a red patch. So before diagnosing erythroplakia, so you need to exclude other conditions that can mimic erythroplakic lesions. So if you uh, exclude other lesions, then only you can uh, say, okay, this is erythroplakia, but erythroplakia, erythroplakia, leukoplakia, all are clinical diagnosis. So when you, whenever you have erythroplakia, you need to assess uh, the histology and then it's mostly it's a severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ or invasive carcinoma. So these are the conditions you will have to exclude diagnosing erythroplakia. So these lesions are rare, yeah, so we don't see them in uh, due to reverse smoking. This in India, we'll see those are potentially malignant disorders. So oral submucous fibrosis. So as you know, it's due to aricanate consumption. And, and this one, so I want to show you this, this uh, from Sri Lanka. So I got this down from a patient with uh, oral cancer. So I think this is Mava. So this is available. He, I think this is uh, Arikanat with some other things in it. So these people are consuming here. So these are the all sort of pathogenic mechanisms in uh, all, all sub because of fibrosis. I don't think we have time to discuss. So we have a clinical staging now. So grade one, two, grade five, right? So grade five being the OSM with all sub uh, SEC. So these are the grades with, depending on the mouth opening. So this is the classic appearance. You all know this blanching mucosa and limited mouth opening. So if you know the histology, we'll see a um, lot of fibrosis in underlying tissues. The fibrosis extend into muscles. That is why you get um, difficulty in mouth opening and atrophy of the epithelium. And uh, mostly sometimes you will see uh, dysplasia in the epithelium. Actinic erythrosis basically you will see in uh, white people in uh, basically in Australia, places like that, and that's due to uh, solar damage. So histologically, we will see solar elastosis and some cases in these plastic lesions. So lichen penis I discussed. So the chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, now they are going to drop from a list of OPMD. So basically a few things about these sites. So be careful about these sites. So very important lateral border, anterior flow of the mouth. These are high risk sites. Whenever you see a lesion in these slides, please refer to a place or try to do biopsy and try to attend. You know, sometimes people will ignore it. So, so as I said, so non-homogeneous lesions has high risk of transformation compared to homogeneous lesions, right? even size. So say if a leukoplakia, you have a leukoplakic lesion in a person who doesn't have any habits. So that patient has a significantly increased risk of malignant transformation. And a little bit on, on, on uh, smokeless tobacco keratosis. So this is, I think, making more prominent in, in, in this tobacco industry because uh, it's different from, uh, you know, quit, little quit chewing. There are various names, various attractive ways of uh, dispatching into even children. So a very problematic case. Um, uh, people, people place those uh, products in the mucosa, buccal mucosal fold on the lip. So you'll get, uh, get this type of keratosis with some fibrosis underlying. But this is considered as a potentially malignant. So histology, you will see children-like keratosis and fibrosis, something like this. So there are, these are the commercial products. Actually, I don't know if these are available, but internet, yes. We have these things available and so many things. And these are the things available in the Sri Lankan market. So I got it from a website. Uh, so different kind of things. So we don't know how people are using it, uh, whether we, our children are using it. So again, all sort of tobacco products and mawa and all sort of bubble, everything. Everything is in here in Sri Lanka. So if you want to study a little bit on um, this uh, or OPMD, so please refer this book. So you have this in the available in the internet. 
can download it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Lin, again for a very comprehensive, descriptive uh, uh, presentation on oral mucus, uh, oral uh, lesions. Uh, would you like to take some questions? Yeah, of course. Yes, okay. Okay. If there are any questions? Yeah, as there are no questions, uh, I think we have to close this session. And if the president is here, I would like to call the president to uh, give this certificate of appreciation. If he's not here, I would like to call one of the past presidents. Ah. Yeah. Professor Manil Fonseca will hand over the certificate of uh, appreciation to Dr. Premit Yen again. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank the chairpersons of the sessions, Dr. Hilary Kure and Dr. Ashoka Munugama. And also thank you very much, uh, dear delegates, for participating. Uh, with that, we conclude the sessions for today. But uh, we warmly welcome you for the inauguration and the uh, uh, Professor S.P. Disanayak Memorial Oration. Uh, that will commence at 6.30 six, uh, at uh, this venue. And uh, hope you could have some tea, refresh yourselves, and be back by about 6.15. Thank you.